Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to start with just one quick comment. Uh, you may have uh, you got the idea by now that the style of my lectures is more really a teaching style and not like a conference style where uh, you go that tell you this is the problem, here are the results, but rather I try to show you what are the main assumption and how the uh, results are essentially derived and obtained. And that's really the way I see the objective of this course. I could have instead dump on you many results uh, saying, well, this is done, this was done, it's easy to obtain, and there are many such statements that you can see, uh, but you know, I chose not to do that, and so uh, occasionally we'll have to limit the number of uh, problems or examples that I will be showing. So I wanted today to uh, start with some additional examples of premix flames and uh, uh, what are the uh, uh, way that we have described this uh, from a theoretical point of view. So uh, we will discuss a few examples. And um, <clears throat> uh, first, uh, I want to go back to what uh, we have uh, uh, derived uh, yesterday. Unfortunately, there seemed to be a one slide which was somewhat missing in my uh, presentation. And this is, uh, I will try to describe it on the blackboard, uh, at least uh, schematically. So what we have seen is that uh, if the uh, flame, uh, premix flame has a preheat zone, uh, which extend here uh, of some uh, lengths, and uh, a reaction zone, uh, which is uh, relatively thin, that uh, we can, using uh, large activation energy uh, approximation, in other words, assuming that the activation is, uh, energy is large, uh, to describe the details of the reaction zone, to derive them, not to assume or any other words, to derive them and obtain condition uh, across the uh, reaction zone, which we refer to as a sheet, as a one uh, a location uh, across which uh, there are some conditions that can be obtained. And so uh, one can generalize this, and in fact, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, there is no the reference here, but one have, this has been derived in the literature, that if you have a weakly curved flame, one which is not highly uh, uh, you know, high fluctuation, then uh, at least, so this is the reaction sheet in the more general circumstances. So uh, locally, uh, the reaction zone is almost like the planar uh, flame that we derived yesterday. And so the conditions across uh, this sheet will be uh, almost with minor generalization the conditions that we derived yesterday using the large activation energy. And so this is the uh, result of the generalization. So you have the sheet. The condition now will be applied across the normal to the sheet and not because maybe more than one direction. Uh, in other words, it may be a, a curved with multi-dimensional shape. And so one has to solve the uh, of course, the fluid equation plus the conservation of energy, the species equation on one side of the reaction zone and on the other. Uh, notice that uh, the reaction term is equal to zero, okay? Uh, and across the sheet, these conditions have to be satisfied. The first line was very trivially obtained just by essentially integrating the equation across the sheet. And the second one was derived by examining the detail of the reaction sheet. And the second one essentially said what should be the mass flux of reactant uh, into the sheet for the combustion to be complete. 
So uh, now in this expression, this jump denote uh, the, the, this, uh, the square bracket uh, denote the, the jump across the reaction sheet, which is located at some location, which in terms of the uh, normal coordinate is at n equal to zero. The normal coordinate is measured from the sheet up, okay? So the first example actually, uh, oh, and uh, the generalization is that uh, instead of uh, the expression uh, which is for a planar flame that depend on the adiabatic temperature only, here it depends on the flame temperature. And so I've multiplied the uh, two expressions by the same exponential, positive and negative, uh, and uh, just to show that this part is equivalent to the, uh, essentially to the mass flux, the adiabatic mass flux with the laminar flame speed, and uh, what you see here is a difference between the actual flame temperature and the adiabatic temperature. So flame temperature when the flame is curved doesn't have to be necessarily that of the adiabatic temperature. The first example, actually, the flame is not curved, but is rather flat. But again, it's not uh, uh, an infinite uh, domain that we discussed earlier. And so uh, what we have here, it's a flat flame over a pore's plug. Uh, so you have uh, a plug here uh, where you see the schematic. Uh, fuel and uh, air uh, are entering uh, the, 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 the chamber from the bottom. Uh, usually there is nitrogen that is helped to stabilize the flame or to retain the edge. But, um, but the main thing is that uh, there is a plug here that uh, force or produce a uniform flow coming out uh, at the position uh, x equal to zero, okay? And the mass flux, which is given now, is m, all right? And then uh, uh, the, typically, if you will have a flame, there will be heat conducted back to the plug. And so to maintain the plug at a constant temperature, uh, one uh, use some uh, cooling coils experimentally, and so uh, you extract the heat and maintain the plug at approximately or at the temperature Tu. Uh, another, uh, uh, so the plug serves as a heat sink that extracts the heat from the combustion field, uh, and uh, uh, then, and because the thermal conductivity of the plate is typically high, then uh, the temperature can be maintained uh, constant. Uh, so this is uh, uh, what basically a flat flame burner looks like, taken from uh, the literature or the website. Uh, and uh, so the boundary condition that you would apply at x equal to zero is that the temperature is constant, as I said, and then there would be a conservation or an equation that uh, described the total mass flux. Uh, how did, uh, uh, of the fuel. Uh, by the way, you notice that I have only used one single reactant for in this example. Of course, you can use two reactants if you're interested to do that. Uh, so the, the single reactant, let's say it's the fuel, uh, uh, will satisfy this condition at x equal to zero. Remember, we derived in principle equation at an interface. This exactly comes from uh, the oscillation. And what it says is that the, conve the convective and diffusive flux uh, uh, of, uh, of the fuel uh, is equal to whatever is being supplied uh, from the porous plug. So it's a very physically uh, clear uh, uh, condition. So those are the two boundary conditions that are applied x equal to zero. Uh, and then uh, very far away, you expect that things uh, become eventually uh, uniform. Now, uh, the condition, so there will be a flame sheet or a reaction sheet at some position xf. And here are the conditions which I discussed uh, earlier, which will be satisfied at x equal to xf, okay? Now, it's easy to solve the problem because these equations are linear and easy to solve. By the way, the only reason that we don't need 
to discuss the fluid mechanics equation because obviously it's a one-dimensional setting, so the mass flux is constant, and if you want, a posteriori can always calculate the pressure changes. So uh, the, we have to uh, solve this equation with uh, no reaction on one side or the other, and then satisfy these conditions. Uh, it's not a very difficult task. Here are the uh, solution, the uh, concentration Y, the temperature T, and then out of the condition you get two additional relation, one that derives, uh, one that gives you essentially the flame temperature Tf uh, given the mass flux M, and the other one that gives you the location of the reaction sheet Xf in the field, okay? Uh, which, of course, you can combine to obtain this relation simply by substituting for M from here to here. What is MA? Uh, I don't think I said how things, well, I didn't scale anything. Uh, MA is just the adiabatic mass flux, which you can actually see. Uh, the, the question of, uh, or the solution are put in dimensional form here. So MA is adiabatic mass flux, you can easily see it, it was just used for reference, so when the flame temperature Tf is adiabatic temperature, uh, e to the zero is one and m equal to ma, okay? So that's clear. And Ta is adiabatic temperature. One thing uh, to say before we discuss this relation is that uh, the, you see the concentration uh, uh, increase, uh, uh, what is it? Oh, that's the temperature, I'm sorry. The temperature is a constant Tu, and then it increases uh, and stay uh, constant at some value Tf, okay, which is the flame temperature. It has to remain constant because the solution of this equation is a constant plus an exponential, and in the positive distance all the way to infinity, exponential blow up, so the coefficient in front must be zero. Uh, so it has to be a constant. Uh, the concentration drop uh, here uh, from within the plug to some value at x equal to zero and then goes to zero at uh, the reaction sheet. And you see that there is a slope here. Uh, in other words, there is a discontinuity in slope at the uh, plug itself. And uh, the slope here is essentially related to how much heat is being conducted to the plug, or if you like, heat loss. So now uh, what we want is to uh, plot this relation. What you can easily see before we graph it is that when Tf is equal to Ta, in other words, when the flame temperature is the adiabatic temperature, uh, e to the zero is one, log of one, uh, log of uh, one over zero is infinity, so Xf goes to infinity. In other words, uh, you would expect that when the reaction sheet is very far Infinity is not infinity, but it's sufficiently far from the plug because it depends on your, what you scale things with. Uh, and so if you go sufficiently far from the plug, the, rea the flame doesn't know the existence of the plug and it will behave like a freely propagating flame with adiabatic temperature. And uh, so the uh, distance will be shorter or smaller or closer to the plug when Tf uh, is uh, less than Ta. And uh, this is what uh, the solution looks like. If you plot the flame, pos the reaction sheet position as a function of flame temperature, uh, when the flame temperature, this should be Ta. I don't know if it's written Tu by mistake, should be Ta. No, no, it's, uh, oh, it's fine, it's Tu. So when uh, this is equal to the adiabatic temperature, which for the values that this was plotted is about six, then it goes to infinity. And then as the flame temperature decreases, uh, the, the reaction or the flame uh, get closer to the plug. It reach a minimum distance. It can never get closer to that minimum distance. And then this part is usually unstable or uh, irrelevant physically. Uh, that's the heat loss to the plug, so of course, uh, uh, when it's far at infinity, the loss is zero, and it increases as you get closer to the plug. And in fact, experimentally, uh, you see those symbols are experimental values, 
And uh, the curve here, which is very similar to the one that I derived now, uh, where uh, some approximation proposed by Kaskan in 53, and these experiments are from Ferguson and Keck. So uh, the idea is that uh, the flame can approach uh, the plug, but uh, not too close. In other words, there is a minimum distance. Uh, such uh, uh, um, configuration can be used for experimentally determine the uh, laminar flame speed. For example, you uh, measure uh, uh, your uh, mass, uh, mass flux, or M, uh, which is essentially related to the propagation speed. Uh, and uh, uh, when you have heat losses, which is the cases that you can measure, uh, you uh, have uh, different points. And then if you extrapolate this to the limit when there is no loss, namely when the flame goes practically all the way to infinity, then uh, the limit should be the laminar flame speed. And there are variations of uh, this idea in the literature to measure the, uh, the, uh, the flame speed. Um, the next example that I want to show you using the same equation is what is known as a flame ball. Now, in order to understand what a flame ball is, I wanted first to describe what a spherical flame is. In other words, a flame which essentially looks like a sphere. So typically, a spherical flame would be uh, when you have a, a mixture in, uh, in your domain, you ignite it at the center, and so essentially a flame starts uh, propagating out in the form of a sphere, leaving behind burned gas. We're going to discuss this problem in detail in the next lecture. Uh, so this is what the spherical flame is. It propagates, in other words, the propagation will be the time derivative of the radius r, and it, it goes out, consuming the reactant outside. It was discovered uh, in some uh, microgravity experiment, in fact, an experiment done uh, on the space shuttle, uh, that sometimes you can see uh, a spherical flame which does not propagate, just sit there stationary. And so how does it burn? Well, it burns purely by diffusion. In other words, you have the diffusion of the reactant towards the reaction sheet and diffusion of heat and product away from the reaction sheet. Now, when you start thinking about it from uh, a simple uh, example of, say, flames that you're familiar with, it um, looks like counterintuitive because the flame has to propagate, but it does not. It's a purely stationary flame. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, such a flame was, uh, I mean, such a mathematical description of this flame was given by Zeldovich early on uh, in the, well, I don't remember the year, I think in one of my slides it would appear. So. Uh, that they were, that they, such a solution mathematic exists, I will show you in a few minutes, but uh, they were actually observed, as I say, in a space shuttle under uh, very, uh, for very lean hydrogen mixture, like uh, equivalence ratio 0.07, which is way below flammability limit. Uh, uh, now, uh, you may wonder how does such a flame exist, because how can you ignite such a very small uh, flame? Well, the reason it was, the, the way it was discovered was uh, by uh, studying uh, the behavior of, uh, of some uh, unstable flame, uh, where the, the flame uh, becomes cellular, and uh, somehow uh, the cells break, and so out of the breaking of the cells, you get some uh, small flames. And then it was discovered those small flames just sit there. And they sit not for a few seconds, but some of the experiments show that they sit for minutes and hours. Um, and so uh, we can uh, show that uh, uh, how to describe uh, this solution from same idea that I showed you until now. Uh, so first of all, uh, 
the velocity is zero. There is no motion, okay? So the equation that you have to solve is simply the Laplacian uh, of the temperature or the concentration, in one case equal to uh, Q omega, in the other words, minus omega, okay? The omega, the reaction rate. And the conditions are clear, uh, Y equal to zero uh, in, inside, because the, the, the ball, inside the ball there is just product, no reactant, and uh, far away it's the mixture where the concentration is YU and temperature TU. So using the asymptotic formulation I just described uh, uh, earlier, what you get is you have to solve this equation with uh, an, no reaction on either side of the sheet and use the condition across the sheet, which I described to you earlier. And so the solution uh, is very simple. Uh, it's a, uh, well, it's a constant inside the ball and outside it decay uh, like one over R, okay? So the temperature decay like one over R and the concentration decay towards the ball as one over R. And, uh, and then uh, you obtain the, the flame temperature out of this discussion, which is, uh, I just noted it as TB. Uh, beta in this relation is the Zeldovich number, which is like the activation energy parameter rescaled that I showed you yesterday. And you obtain the size of the ball, which is given by this expression, and the flame temperature, which is given here. Uh, one of the most interesting thing is to look at the flame temperature, which is clearly not the adiabatic temperature, which will be this, but there is this uh, different factor, which is one over the Lewis number minus one. Now, I told you that they were observed for very, very lean hydrogen air flame, for which uh, the Lewis number is extremely small, so this is quite large. And so, or if you like, this is quite large. So in lean hydrogen air mixture, or uh, in methane air containing CO2 or SF6, the effective Lewis number become very small and the flame temperature is substantial, uh, even though when, uh, even that uh, when TA is for such uh, weak uh, mixture is very small. And so uh, uh, this is uh, one of the features of flame balls. Now it turned out that when you do, uh, when you have this solution, you can study its stability. It turned out that they are always unstable. But then they were observed experimentally, so how was this explained? So there were some studies that have found out that uh, the key, uh, uh, well, uh, this is just the first statement saying that uh, they were first discovered by Zildovich, such, such type of solution. But being uh, unstable, uh, the implication was that they could not be observed uh, physically. However, uh, later on, it, they were found uh, uh, to be uh, uh, observed in microgravity condition, and the explanation turned out to be that uh, some radiant heat loss, which essentially precipitated by the diluents, that like the CO2 and the SF6, that apparently have sufficient radiation um, uh, effects that, uh, uh, that are used in for these, to, to, they are used to decrease the Lewis number sufficiently so that you can have that solution uh, uh, in existence. So under microgravity condition, these losses turn out to stabilize the flame. There are some other uh, possible discussion what could stabilize the flame, but anyway, there must be a stabilizing mechanism and this is one, this was suggested uh, in the literature. Okay, and uh, if you go to the NASA uh, microgravity webpage, you can see some of these flame balls. Uh, note the size. Here it's about one centimeter in diameter, so it's extremely, they are extremely small. Here they are even less than one centimeter. And uh, look that some of these uh, are sustained for a very long time, 500 seconds, 300 seconds they are seen to be remain stationary. Okay, the next uh, 
example that I want to discuss. And again, with the same idea that I started the lecture today, it's just to show you the uh, idea, so the simple uh, uh, assumption, mathematical ideas that are used to describe the problem. That's my focus and not just uh, give you results of this problem. So flame propagation in long, narrow channels. Uh, so the first, the idea is that you have a very long channel and you have a uh, flame which is propagate, leaving behind burning gas which expand and move to the other side of the channel. Uh, I'm interested to examine channels which are very uh, narrow. So H uh, is going to be assumed to be much less than the flame thickness LF. Uh, at the start, this, uh, of course, for uh, uh, anyone who wants to maybe study an, a real problem will have difficulties accepting this approximation because it means uh, uh, the, uh, you have a, a channel which is narrower than the flame thickness and flame will not propagate, you would argue. It's below the uh, quenching distance that the flame propagates. First of all, if the walls are adiabatic, in principle, the flame will propagate, no matter how small or narrow uh, the channel is. But this is a mathematical simplification, and uh, what we will see is that it is useful because it shows you uh, the structure of the mathematical equation, that sometimes they persist beyond the uh, limit that you are proposing or using. Sometimes it does not. So you analyze the problem and then you examine. Does it make sense physically or you validate it with numerics and so on. And so that's essentially the steps that I will be showing you here. So the first thing that I want to do, in addition to this assumption that it's uh, uh, narrow, uh, uh, it's a long channel. Long, it's perfectly fine, much longer than the flame thickness. Flame thickness is a fraction of a millimeter, so a meter is certainly long, <laughs> or half a meter. Okay, uh, we are going to dimensionalize the equation. And that's another important way how you write the equation in dimensionless form. If I, if I uh, use the, uh, uh, the units of uh, lengths to be the same in the width as long as in the lengths, you see I will not gain much. Uh, but in this case, what I have to scale the x distance uh, with respect to the flame thickness and the, y thickness and the y distance with respect to the width. Okay, and I'll show you in a minute why it's important. Then time uh, 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 velocities are scaled with respect to the laminar flame thickness, something that we have derived, so we know what it is. We have an expression for it, if you like. And uh, the uh, velocity in the v direction, the y direction, is scaled, uh, note, with this a, which represents the ratio h over lf, which I told you is going to be uh, small. And then uh, density with the unburned value, pressure and temperature and uh, uh, fuel uh, uh, mass fraction. I here I normalized it. I told you yesterday I don't always do that. Sometimes we do. So uh, th these are the equation. Now the reason for um, uh, scaling uh, the x and y differently is very simple. Uh, the continuity equation, at least in, uh, in the simple, well, you can put a density if you want, uh, is such, uh, well, you can also add the time if you want, doesn't matter. Uh, if you scale, uh, x uh, and y in the same way, uh, and you assume that x is, uh, that, uh, x is scaled with respect to a, which is small, then it, it fall into one dimensional problem, which is not of interest. And so you want to scale things such that you can retain uh, the continuity equation, or you can retain the, uh, both the x and y variation. This is typically done if any one of you have had any fluid mechanics uh, problem uh, discussing thin films. This is the typical assumption made, or lubrication theory is essentially based on this. That's how you derive the 
famous Reynolds equation, lubrication theory. So, um, so this is the idea. And then uh, when, you, uh, uh, when you write the equation in dimensionless form, here they are. So you see in the continuity equation, both terms are uh, of the same order. But then uh, in the other equations, the parameter a, which is remember is small, appears in different places. So uh, I don't have to just read the equation, here they are. Uh, so these are the full equation, continuity in x and y. Uh, by the way, it's obvious that I'm looking only at two-dimensional problem. One can also look equivalently at the uh, axisymmetric problem, same type of result that you will get. Of course, the end result may be a little bit different. So uh, the temperature and the equation for y, uh, q is the heat release parameter, everything else you know, parental number and so on. The, the boundary condition, okay, so we have to say something about the boundary condition. So first of all, at the two upper, at the walls, uh, no slip, u equal to zero, v equal to zero. Uh, then uh, there is, uh, it's adiabatic, the TDY is zero, and there is no uh, uh, penetration of, uh, so dy, dy, dy is. But the more interesting condition will be uh, on the x at the uh, two sides of the, uh, of the channel. So um, if the two ends are open, then you expect that the pressure will essentially go to the ambient pressure, which is scaled here to be p equal to zero. In other words, p is p minus the... And uh, uh, that's the two, that's it. That's the two condition for open channel. For uh, closed end, uh, you expect that, of course, where the end is closed, the velocity must go to zero. So these are the condition that we will apply. Now here are the same equation that I wrote before, but what I want to show you uh, in color here is the balance. So the term, the larger terms, well, the first one is totally balanced. The second one gives you uh, a balance between the pressure gradient in the ax axial direction and the uh, second derivative of u with respect to i. Both are uh, one over a squared. And in the third equation, dpdy, is multiply one over a to the four, so everything else is negligible or small. So the equation to solve, again, it's almost identical to what you do in lubrication theory. So the last equation tells you that p does not depend on y. p depends on x and t. In other words, the channel is narrow, and so the pressure across is almost negligible, uh, and so what it depends only in the x direction. And then uh, you can solve for u because the PDX is depending only on x, uh, and you obtain essentially a quadratic solution, which is like Poiseuille flow. So essentially your flow is Poiseuille flow, but what is the pressure gradient? And that's the main question that you would have to address through the combustion equation. So the, before I uh, uh, discuss that, just want to point out that uh, if you uh, integrate u across the channel, uh, then uh, you get that the mean velocity, which I denoted by u bar, uh, is uh, e equal or it's related, it's, a, it's proportional to the pressure gradient. So whether I say mean velocity or pressure gradient, it's an equivalent uh, statement. So u equal to the mean velocity y minus y squared, that's the Poiseuille flow, and u bar is the uh, mean velocity. So, uh, well, that's recapturing what I said. The flow in the channel is Poiseuille flow with pressure gradients or mean velocity that drive the flow, uh, the unburned and burned gas, and determined by the combustion equation. And so, um, uh, here are the combustion equation, again, using the small parameter a. So what you see is that the term multiplying the second derivative in y uh, is multiplied by the reciprocal, or it's the largest term, the reciprocal of the small parameter, which uh, when you integrate across the channel, use the boundary condition, 
you end up to uh, determine that T effectively is independent to leading order uh, uh, by Y, depend only on X and T. Again, it's not surprising. Properties across the narrow channel uh, are on the average, uh, uh, don't change across the channel, change along the channel. But we need to determine the, these functions still. So we go to the, uh, well, before we do that, we can uh, derive from the continuity equation uh, using the fact that rho uh, does not depend on uh, y, uh, so it can be uh, uh, pulled out from here. You get rho bar dv dy, and since it depends uh, uh, only on, uh, since the u have a dependence on y, pulled out, uh, anyway, it's a trivial thing to see that equation. And then uh, when you satisfy the condition, the no slip at the both end, you get two things. One is that uh, the solution for V, in other words, you obtain the vertical uh, velocity, uh, uh, the functional form of the vertical velocity. Note that it depends on the mean uh, density. And uh, an equation that tells you that essentially the mean density and the mean uh, velocity satisfy a continuity type equation. Okay, now uh, I said that we have to determine T and Y, so we go into the equation, we introduce a perturbation of order A square, and we get the second order equation, or the first order, depending how you, first order, second order is a matter of relative, what you call first. Some people call first the first, second, second, some people call leading order the first, and then the next. <laughs> So it's just a word uh, or a convention. Okay, so if you use this equation, again, integrate on y from zero to one, uh, the contribution from this perturbation drop, and what you obtain is an equation for uh, the mean value. Well, it's not surprising, but it's systematically obtained that the mean property satisfy the combustion equation that you need to uh, uh, determine, and so that uh, describe T and Y. So these are the equations that we have to solve, uh, and uh, in short, uh, here, are, here is the problem. You have a continuity equation, two equations with the equation of state. So the next question is, can this problem admit a wave-like solution? In other words, a solution that propagate uh, from one end to the other, uh, at a constant velocity u. In other words, can you look for solution x minus capital UT, y x minus capital UT, u being a constant, which is the propagation speed, which as you see, well, that you have a Poiseuille flow, a Poiseuille flow, and clearly the burn gas expand, move away, so that's the picture that you would have. And uh, this is the flame structure near the region where the flame is. So if there is such a solution, it will have to satisfy a simpler set of essentially ODEs written in terms of the uh, coordinate which is attached with the flame, which is Xi. Uh, if you uh, look uh, for a planar, since those equations are exactly the solution of a planar flame front, it implies that M, the mass flux, which is uh, rho u bar minus u from here, uh, from the continuity equation, must be equal to minus one. Why minus one, not plus one? Because in this example, the flame is propagating to the right. Yesterday, my flame was, yesterday was Tuesday. Today, Wednesday, it's propagated to the right. So anyway, uh, uh, it, it therefore implied that u bar, the mean velocity, it's the propagation speed minus t bar, okay? It's an important relation, and so let's look at it. What does it say? So here is it, here it is. Just remember that u is x dot f, it's the propagation speed. It's the time rate of change of the position of the flame. Okay, so let's start with a propagation toward the closed end. So the end here is closed. The end here is closed, the velocity must be zero at the end, so the mean velocity must be also zero. The mean velocity is zero. Uh, this is the unburned gas. So T bar must be equal to one, essentially the unburned value. 
And so out of this relation, you obtain that uh, what uh, x f dot or u is equal, u is equal to one in dimensional form, it will be, it propagated the laminar flame speed. So if uh, uh, the flame is propagating towards a closed end, it will propagate at the laminar flame speed, the gas behind, uh, the burn gas expand and move out, and since it's open, it's freely to leave, and it does not affect the solution. Of course, uh, uh, it goes without saying that uh, when the flame reach very close to the end, the discussion has to be modified, or that doesn't apply to that. So it applies for most of the channel, but uh, up to towards the end. That's the nature of the solution. Uh, what about the propagation in a closed end? Well, now uh, the burn gas uh, must remain at rest because the velocity have to go to zero. And since that's the burn gas, then the temperature is the adiabatic temperature. Here it's one plus Q. And, uh, and uh, so from this relation, you get that capital U is one plus Q. In other words, uh, the uh, the flame position or the speed is going to be sigma SL. Uh, sigma being the ratio of the uh, burn to unburned uh, temperature or the ratio of the unburned to burn uh, density, okay? Uh, which is again not a surprising result because uh, essentially uh, since the burn gas is at rest, the flame propagate relative to the burn gas at that speed and uh, relative to the burn gas, you have to multiply by the density ratio. So those are the two, uh, if you like, uh, simple cases. The, as I written here, flame propagate to the right at a speed sigma SL. The, it, it pushes the unburned gas uh, 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 forward, but the unburned gas leave the channel or is allowed to leave it freely, and so it, again, it doesn't affect significantly the solution. Um, this is, by the way, it's very similar to what happened in a spherically expanding flame, again, a problem that we will discuss uh, later today. And the third uh, position or the third condition is propagation in an open channel at both ends. Uh, now, uh, you don't have condition on the velocity to apply, but you have condition on the pressure. But remember that the mean velocity was related to the pressure gradient. So if you assume that the pressure far at zero and at L at the two ends is gonna go to the ambient pressure, P is zero, then um, what you obtain is uh, you can uh, take this relation, integrate it uh, from one end to another of the channel, use the, this approximation, uh, since that should be equal to zero because when you integrate you get P at L minus P at zero, you obtain a relation for this. Uh, I used a little bit some approximation here to obtain this, uh, but I will uh, modify that in a little bit. Uh, so anyway, without going into the detail, you can show that XF behave in this way. In other words, uh, the, again, this is dimensional. L is the length of the channel, Q is the heat release, and then you have E to the Q SL uh, times the T. In other words, uh, as time progressed, the flame uh, move faster and faster, and there is an acceleration. And the speed is given by this. This is a flame position, this is a speed. So the flame accelerate. Uh, flame accelerate when traveling down the channel uh, with the fresh mixture and the burn gas leaving the channel freely uh, at both ends as Poiseuil flow. Uh, these are some uh, graphs that show you uh, the, actually this, does not involve this small approximation that I did before because it requires some uh, numerical evaluation, but it's uh, straightforward. Uh, what you see here is the actual velocity. Of course, it's negative uh, before to the left of the flame, positive to the right, and you see that uh, uh, the mean uh, velocity increases when you move uh, from in time. Tau is a scaled uh, time, it's written here. Okay, and uh, theta is the temperature, it's the difference between the um, ambient temperature divided by the adiabatic value. So again, on the burn side, adiabatic, and then it drops. 
So the flame is rather thin and it propagates this way, and this is the pressure gradient. And you see that the pressure gradient, a significant pressure gradient is developed in the uh, unburned gas, and that's what caused the flame to accelerate. And this is the acceleration uh, for different value of the uh, uh, heat release. Uh, some of those curves are, uh, what are the, uh, uh, forgot now what is one of those curves. The, um, oh, different channel lengths. So the different curves here is for different channel lengths. I think it shows like 100, 200, or something, 50, something like that. Anyway, the next uh, step is actually, uh, well, it's interesting to note that uh, such experiments were done many, many years ago. In fact, there was a lot of experiment on flame propagation channels started from uh, Malar and Le Chatelier, but uh, experimentally, this type of ex uh, acceleration was observed by uh, uh, Masson and Wheeler, uh, and it showed for propane air mixture for different equivalence ratio, which is equivalent to saying different heat release. So the trend that you see here is very similar to what the observation uh, that we have shown. Okay, the next step was to forget the A is small and to do the numerical problem in 2D. So you solve the full problem, A is order one. And uh, here is what you obtain. You see that, again, uh, there is a, a sharp change near the flame, but then there is a significant uh, pressure gradient that developed on towards the unburned gas that cause, as I said, this acceleration. And uh, here are the numerical results for different values of A. A, remember, is that parameter H over the flame thickness, okay? Uh, A equal to five give us a result which is very, very, very close to A very small. So I assumed in the beginning A very small. I told you it's probably most people will say it's, uh, it's, it's nonsense because you cannot have such flame propagating in very narrow. But the mathematical structure of the equation seems to be similar uh, for A sufficiently large up to five. Beyond that, of course, there are other changes and you will see in the next picture why the two-dimensional effect have an effect on the flame. So uh, for channels like of lengths L, L is by the way scaled, scaled with respect to the flame thickness, 150, 250, 200. You see that the acceleration uh, passed a certain distance uh, along the channel. Uh, uh, it's quite significant and notice that the number uh, here are much uh, more or much uh, larger than what you obtain for the narrow channel. And they seem to tend to a limit when L become uh, infinite, and the location where the acceleration occur uh, is earlier and earlier, the longer the channel is. But of course, it's scaled, so. Okay, so uh, here uh, is uh, a picture which is a bit maybe complex, but I will try to explain it, uh, which describe the uh, flow field and temperature field in the vicinity of the flame. In other words, that's not the entire channel which is drawn here. Uh, so, uh, and, and this one is for A equal to five, and I will show you later uh, for larger uh, uh, lengths, for uh, L larger, uh, for A equal to 10, say, and different, uh, for A equal to 10. So um, I put here the picture so to remind you that the flow to the left and to the right is uh, a parabolic or prosaic type flow. And uh, the, uh, what you see in this graph is the following. Uh, on the top, you see the actual uh, velocity uh, relative to the lab. Uh, so the, you see that the, those are streamlines, so the streamlines are moving to the left, and here the streamlines are moving to the right. At the bottom figure, it's the flow relative to the flame. And so what you see is that there is a flow, uh, the, the, an observer moving the flame, feel or see a, a, a mass flux of, uh, of, of reactant uh, coming towards him. So that's what you see here. 
uh, the, so, and, the, and the color are essentially, uh, well, those are the streamline. Now, the color on the top is reaction rates. So you see blue essentially say that the reaction is almost negligible and the large reaction occur here. So those are reaction rate contour. And at the bottom, it's temperature uh, isotherm, if you like, so the hot flame and the region of the preheat zone and so on. Okay, and so this is the nature of the flow. Uh, I will say a little bit more about this in a minute. Uh, here is uh, for A equal to 10 at different location as the flame move uh, more and more to the right. So I moved the picture just to give you the proper impression. The propagation speed here is, of course, it starts accelerating. So 3.8726, 14.1. Of course, it's uh, in dimensionless form. What's interesting is that uh, because uh, there is friction and uh, the, must, uh, the velocity must go to zero uh, at the wall, then the continuity equation essentially will tell you that there will be a, a contribution of uh, the derivative of V with respect to I, in other words, some gradient of the flow uh, vertically. Uh, which is uh, uh, approximately given by this relation. So it is the friction which is combined with the gas expansion related with the uh, uh, density changes that uh, cause primarily uh, this, uh, this acceleration. But as the flame uh, get more and more curved, you see what happens, uh, the, the flow stretches it out. And in fact, in the next lecture, we'll talk about flame stretch. And you will see that this, what you see here, it's very similar to what happened in a counter flow. In other words, in two jets impinging against each other where the flame is under strain. So that strain, which keep on increasing, caused the flame to keep on uh, accelerating. So the flame acceleration is due to the momentum thrust, which results from the combined effect of wall friction and gas expansion. Uh, actually, it was proposed years ago by Shelkin, uh, mostly through experiment and observation. And uh, uh, this is consistent with the uh, derivation here. Uh, I think I have, what, five more minutes? Good. <laughs> now I have a good. Uh, Okay, I uh, will. Uh, I didn't plan on have this first, and I don't think it's on your notes. Uh, I will add uh, just a quick comment about compressibility effects. So, uh, so far, uh, yesterday we talked about the low Mach number approximation. In other words, Mach number is typically small in flame, and therefore uh, the effects are uh, uh, usually negligible. What uh, I want to show you in, in this example, and it's really the only time I will bring uh, the effect of compressibility or Mach number is to show you small effect of compressibility may also have an influence on the flame acceleration. And so uh, what is the changes in the equation? I won't go through a lot of details, but you can uh, see this from the equation that we derived uh, uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, the there are two places where the pressure uh, come in. First of all, in the energy equation, remember it was a DPDT. So when uh, we first neglected that term because the Mach number is small, now it will appear here in, with a small parameter, capital lambda, uh, which is the, essentially the Mach number uh, square. Uh, in this case, divided by A square. This is small, this is small, so I am going to assume that Lambda is order one, okay? A, again, is small, the same idea that I started the discussion uh, earlier. And then in the equation of state, uh, the pressure, remember, we kept it as being constant, the ambient value, but now it's plus a small perturbation, but uh, because, again, the channel is narrow, that will be like an, uh, uh, well, an effect that we want to consider. Uh, and I said I'm not going to show much detail here. I just added those as a quick example. 
uh, the comp the, it, it seems uh, it turned out after you manipulate some of the equation that this turned out to be the important uh, compressibility parameter. Again, it's related to this because you see here is the Mach number square and the A would appear from the H square uh, over LF square, but also the length of the channel enter this parameter. Okay. Uh, now uh, what we want is to solve uh, this uh, problem. By the way, uh, you notice that uh, you have here average values and so on because I've used exactly the same approximation that I made before, that the channel is narrow and that uh, eventually you end up with the eigenvalue problem. Uh, in the absence of compressibility, this is like the laminar, uh, planar laminar flame problem that I argued before. Now it's a difference, so we have to address this problem and we'll address it for open uh, uh, at both ends or uh, close at the ignition end. In other words, I'm not going to show all the three possibilities. Uh, this is uh, just uh, a quick picture to show you that when pi, this pi is, remember, the Mach number effect or compressibility effect. Equal to zero, those are exactly the result I showed you earlier. Okay? These are the result when this parameter is one. And so you see there is some quite, quite a difference uh, between the two. First of all, the burn, the burn temperature keep on increasing due to uh, uh, adiabatic compression and um, or due to the compressibility, the gas gets compressed, temperature increases, but also there is a sharper pressure gradient that develop uh, in the unburned gas. So the compressibility effect causes a preheating of the fresh mixture, which you can see here, as opposed to here, and uh, increase in flame temperature, sharper pressure gradient. And so what you see is that, in fact, if this was the approximation that I mentioned to you before, in the absence of compressibility, now there will be a, 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 a sharper uh, or, or a, an acceleration that occur uh, quite early in, in, the, um, in, in the process. Okay, and these are exactly the figure I showed you before. Uh, so that's uh, similar to what I showed you. Now, uh, what is this? This is, uh, this is an interesting case because when the propagation uh, occur in a channel which is closed at the ignition end, so it's closed here, now you see the temperature uh, increase is significantly larger, again, because of adiabatic compression in this region, and uh, the uh, pressure does not change very much in the burn gas eventually, but it does uh, uh, create a sharp gradient here. So we observe the preheating of the fresh mixture, an increase in temperature and pressure in the burn gas due to adiabatic compression, sharp pressure gradient towards the fresh mixture, which create a thrust that lead to acceleration. In other words, in addition to what we have seen before, now compressibility can add uh, the, the, um, to the acceleration. One uh, minor point, um, I don't know if minor, but an interesting point is that when you increase this pi significantly, uh, then uh, seems to be something here which is not very clear. And so you don't just leave it uh, when you have such a calculation. You want to investigate it. So what you, question mark. So what you uh, find out that when you increase pi to 5 and 10, suddenly it starts propagating at a constant speed. You know, that you have another steady propagation that happened. And so uh, this actually was um, uh, first observed in a different uh, type of study interested in, in the DDT, essentially by Sivashinsky and some of his collaborators. And so uh, what it turned out that this steady propagation problem can be discussed, and uh, due to the time I will just uh, not discuss it too much, but say that um, uh, there is a different structure of a flame propagation, which is which we refer to as uh, instead, instead of an adiabatically driven steady propagation, a compression driven steady propagation. So what you have here is uh, uh, you see the pressure 
uh, in the burned gas is nearly constant, and then you drop in the unburned gas. Uh, well, the mass fraction and temperature behave almost similarly, although there is a sharp here decrease before uh, the exponential drop. Uh, but uh, what is interesting about the density, this is density minus the unburned. One is unburned. So it compresses, so there is an increase in density, which then drop in the flame. And uh, so the, uh, the equation of state is essentially more pressure-temperature uh, relation rather than pressure-density uh, relation. Uh, what is, uh, I think there is one more thing here, yeah. And so here is the propagation speed of this compression, that's a C, compression-driven flame uh, as a function of the Zeldovich parameter beta. The calculation were done here for finite uh, re uh, chemical re uh, rate, and so it's not the large activation energy, so beta is a parameter, and this is what you see. Uh, the, there is an asymptotic expression, which is given here, a numerical solution that show consistency, but that's not what I want to emphasize. What I want to emphasize is what you see here. First of all, uh, I wrote for comparison what the constant pressure, which is the classical laminar flame speed ex expression is compared to this. This is the adiabatic temperature, which is the unburned gas, heat release divided by Cp. We derived it yesterday and the day before. Note that the temperature that you obtain for this flame is a different temperature, which is divided by Cv, which is like a constant volume uh, adiabatic temperature. Uh, since uh, Cv is always smaller than Cp, the temperature is significantly larger, and that's what you saw in, in, in those calculations. And because of that, in the exponential here, you have the, uh, uh, the, the uh, whatever you want to call it, the adiabatic temperature, constant volume adiabatic temperature, which cause a larger speed than, or a significantly actually larger speed than the laminar flame speed. And uh, this is the end of this talk. Uh, and uh, next one, we will talk about the so-called hydrodynamic theory. So the next uh, talk, uh, next two talks will be on hydrodynamic theory of uh, flames, of premix flames. And we are going to start the first lecture with what I refer to as leading order effect, because we can learn a lot just from the leading order effect, but not everything. So we're going to see how we progress in this way. Again, uh, I will repeat the comment I told you earlier. I could have come and say, well, by now we know more, and here are the final result, and that's what we get. I want to show you a progress of thinking or development which have taken uh, years in the, uh, uh, in the uh, combustion community. So uh, the flame speed uh, is, is that the first slide? Yeah, OK. So the first thing I want to talk about, the notion of flame speed. So the flame speed is or sometimes referred to as displacement speed, uh, is defined as the propagation speed of a flame relative to the gas velocity. And clearly, this is, which is uh, essentially quiescent. In other words, uh, no, no, sorry, relative to the gas velocity. So if it's quiescent, it's just whatever its speed. If it's not quiescent, it's relative to the velocity of the gas. I'm going to write an equation for it. So uh, this is, of course, a very important property. Uh, and uh, you can see how many uh, experimental methods, uh, computational, experimental data, people have uh, uh, done to determine the flame speed of different mixture. And uh, prob uh, I mean, evidently, it's a very important, tells you the first effect, how much it will take to burn a mixture of the combustor from one end to another. It's a very simple uh, thing. OK, of course, there are complications to this, but that's OK. Now, the notion of a flame speed has a precise meaning when the flame is planar 
and propagate steadily because then the mass flux M towards the flame is a constant and the entire structure, in other words, doesn't change through the flame. And so when you divide the mass flux by the density of the unburned gas, you obtain the speed that this whole structure, okay, propagate uh, from one side to another uh, into the, I mean, propagate into the unburned mixture. Now, uh, what happens if you have a flame which is curved or is multidimensional? So what you would like is to define uh, the speed of the flame, okay, uh, relative to the incoming velocity. So Vf is the propagation speed at a certain point uh, along the normal. That is usually how you define the speed of an interface. Uh, relative to the incoming flow, which is Vn. So it's written here, uh, and that's a definition, Sf, uh, the flame speed is minus Vf plus V star dot n, star meaning evaluated on the unburned side uh, of the velocity, uh, which I wrote, it's, it's written here as well, so it doesn't matter. Now the reason minus and plus simply because uh, I have selected to choose, and that will be consistent in the remaining of the lecture, that my normal point out towards the burn gas, okay? So Vf is negative, Vn is positive. Um, now, this uh, definition is somewhat ambiguous for a different, for a general flame, because the mass flux through the flame is not constant. And so it depends uh, where you evaluate it. So, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, essentially, the definition is um, depend on the location where you would measure or when you consider the propagation speed of the flame. Uh, what else do I say? Okay, and it's of course local. So it's the local speed here. In other words, this speed here may not be equal to the speed here or the speed here. Um, okay. Now, now the hydrodynamic theory, then we'll go back to this notion of flame speed. So the idea of the hydrodynamic uh, um, uh, theory is that the flame is relatively thin. Uh, excuse me for a second, I am, oh, okay, fine. Uh, so the, the flame is relatively thin. In reality, the flame is, uh, let's say, at about a millimeter, usually it's even less than that. And uh, usually the corrugation are perhaps something of the order of a centimeter or so. So the ratio of the flame thickness to those uh, corrugation, which I call a hydrodynamic length, is typically a small parameter. This is the idea behind uh, this uh, theory. When I say the flame, I mean the entire flame, okay? So you see the region here consists uh, of the entire region where the temperature go from the unburned to the burn and the uh, fuel, let's say, is consumed. And it include in it also the reaction zone. So it include both the preheat and the reaction zone, the entire flame. So the entire flame in this limit is treated as a boundary layer which is embedded in the flow, okay? And uh, what you are, um, uh, what is else? Uh, okay, so this is basically this. Now, uh, what I wanted to show you here, just the different scales, so you get an idea what I mean by uh, a thin flame. So this is the structure that we have described yesterday. Uh, this is the flame thickness. So this is when you look uh, and you focus on the length scale of a flame thickness, that's what you see. But when you focus on a much, much larger scale, Essentially, that same structure will look like uh, what you see here. In other words, a sharp uh, change in temperature and concentration, or in other words, uh, the flame becomes like a discontinuity in temperature and concentration. This is on the length scale L, which, as I said earlier, assumed is much larger than LF. So what you see is on the, un so, so, so the flame separates a region where the temperature is Tu, which is this region, uh, from a region where the temperature is the burn temperature, in this case, the adiabatic temperature. 
And the density similarly is a constant here and a different constant here. And of course the concentration is some value and it's zero here, okay? Whatever is, uh, uh, without uh, explicitly said, what I uh, intend here is that the, pre the mixture is homogeneous. In other words, the Y concentration, Y very far to the, say, the left, uh, there is no gradient. Otherwise, it's a different problem and actually uh, uh, there was no theory that was developed for this. Uh, so that's a nice exercise if you are interested. Not exercise, a nice uh, PhD ex uh, thesis if you are interested. Anyway, so uh, when the ratio is small, delta goes to zero, uh, the flame shrink to a surface. So the boundary layer that I showed you before, the entire boundary layer, the entire flame shrink to the surface. And the surface will separate the unburned gas from the burned gas and I'm describing that uh, surface by a function uh, uh, f of position and time equal to zero. This is a way that you describe a surface in general. And uh, the notation that uh, I will adopt is that f is positive on this side, f is negative in the unburned side. Again, if you choose differently, some of the detail will be different. Uh, now, any interface has some geometric properties. Two geometric properties, nothing to do with flames, is that the normal can be computed from the gradient of f divided by its norm. If uh, an equation, an explicit equation can be written from, for the surface, let's say x equal to f of y z, which is not always possible, especially when the flame falls and so on. That's why I wrote it in general. Uh, then it's simpler, it takes this form. And the second geometric property is the normal propagation of the interface of the surface, which is given by minus the derivative of f with respect to time divided by its norm, all this. So these are uh, two uh, things that, uh, or two properties once you know the surface that you can compute, and uh, here they are. Okay, so, um, uh, now that we have a surface that describes the flame, the flame speed is uniquely defined because it's exactly the speed of that interface relative to the flow. The flow, if the flow is known, you can compute this quantity. There is no ambiguity. In uh, other type of calculation, say, what you will have to choose is some isotherm or some uh, uh, s some contour of uh, usually a radical or some other species to represent the surface. But uh, one of you can choose one thing, the other one choose something else, and when you compare things, they don't compare, and then you wonder why, and you say, you are wrong, you are right, and so on. So here there is no ambiguity, okay? The big question is, of course, how do you, after this, relate this to experiment? Well, that's, uh, it requires uh, smart thinking how to do it and careful thinking how to do it, but that's a good question. Uh, asymptotic theory does not tell you two things. It doesn't tell you how you compare to experiment and does not tell you how big or small the parameter should be for the theory to be correct. The parameter should go to in principle to zero for the solution to be accurate. Any small parameter can give a good approximation. How small should be? We don't know, so that's something that remains to always to be uh, examined and evaluated. So, the key point here is that the flame speed is an asymptotic concept. Uh, it is a local property it can vary along the flame surface and is uniquely determined by this. All right, a fundamental question is, how does this flame speed depend on the local flow and mixture condition? And the answer to this in, in general is not known, okay? Maybe under some condition you obtain it, maybe it's through uh, computation, DNS, simulation, and so on. There is some result from the asymptotic theory and uh, this is limited to, uh, as you will see uh, later on today. So the early studies that tried to address this problem were interested 
in the stability of planar flame, and they were done by uh, uh, two, uh, by now very famous scientists, one of them was of course very famous at the time, uh, both Darieux and Landau in about the same time, okay? Uh, the reason that uh, this paper was never published, but uh, many people uh, in the community have a copy of it. It was presented in uh, a conference, but due to the Second World War, it was never published thereafter. Uh, the paper of Landau uh, appears, and in fact, it's exercised in his book uh, on combustion or slow combustion, I think the title, and it's an exercise down there. So if you read Lando's book and you do all his exercise, you know the answer. <laughs> anyway, so the main assumption that uh, Darian Lando did is that the flame speed, let's take the laminar flame speed, okay? It's a constant and it's the one like a planar flame, uh, which is the simplest uh, idea and it's the leading order effect, in fact. And the flame temperature is the adiabatic temperature. So, uh, advances in this idea were done by Mark Steen in 1951. Again, because the stability results that we will discuss on Friday uh, of Darien and Landau were not uh, satisfactory. At least they created some confusion. We will discuss that then. And so he tried to, uh, uh, tried to improve this model. He added a phenomenological uh, dependence uh, of the flame speed on curvature. So he said that it must depend on the local curvature of the flame, which is a brilliant idea, by the way, and that's why the Markstein name keep on appearing in many of the uh, current literature. Uh, but the, the only missing thing is that he did not derive this relation, and so the coefficients that depend on the curvature or that's proportional to between the flame speed and curvature was at the time determined only experimentally, was an empirical number. Nowadays, we have uh, better things, but we will come to that. There were rigorous studies in the 80s that built on the success of uh, the activation energy asymptotic result that I showed you yesterday, and it's an important uh, just uh, of, uh, a point of historical or maybe of scientific uh, ideas. When you develop, you can have, uh, there is a, <laughs> I divert now from my lecture, but sorry about that. There's a very interesting, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book by Van Dyke, uh, Perturbation Method in Fluid Mechanics. Uh, Van Dyke is one of the leader in uh, perturbation method and uh, uh, asymptotic method, primarily boundary layer matched asymptotic expansion. And Milton Van Dyke uh, uh, wrote in his book, which was probably one of the first book, another equivalent book was written by Julian Cole from at the time at Caltech. Uh, Van Dyke was at Stanford. Uh, and uh, the, uh, he writes in the beginning of his book that there are brilliant, uh, or very nice approximation in the literature on fluid mechanics that he classified as irrational, as opposed to perturbation method and asymptotic method, which he classified as rational. Now, don't misunderstand. Irrational doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a negative term. The term that he meant is that they are limited approximations. They are brilliant approximations because to come with approximation just out of nowhere that works, it's beautiful. But the approximation has a limit. You cannot do beyond that. As opposed to perturbation method where you can always improve by adding maybe another term in the expansion or something alike. And so uh, the until the development of activation energy have developed more systematically as opposed to the Russian school of Zeldovich and Frank Kamenetsky uh, that uh, had the idea but didn't do it systematically through asymptotic method. The development after being done systematically have improved significantly because then it was able to do more 
to do a corrugated flame, to do flame stability problem, etc. Okay, so this is an important uh, point that I wanted to make. So at that time, general expression were obtained, uh, uh, and I will discuss that in the next lecture. I don't want to uh, discuss it now. So the discussion now will be that the flame speed is the laminar flame speed, and we can learn enough just by this simple assumption. So in this lecture, we adopt the Dario Landau hypothesis. Okay, so um, these are uh, the general equation that we have derived uh, uh, before. And the idea is that uh, all the viscous terms, when you scale the equation appropriate, appropriately, you find that they are of the order of delta. In other words, they are order of uh, because, uh, of course, diffusion occur on the flame thickness, and relative to the large uh, scale, they will be small. So all the diffusion effect and the reaction effect are small. What is left is um, the uh, continuity equation, uh, if you like, uh, the Euler equation, uh, and uh, the equation uh, for the temperature and mass fraction that the material derivative is equal to zero and the equation of state. Uh, I think I put here a comment. Oh, no. And this equation, I will make the comment in a minute. So this equation are supplemented by Rankine-Nugonio relation because this equation are valid only on one side of the flame and on the other side of the flame. And so you have to satisfy some condition across and we, uh, in fact, derived this Rangin-Uconio relation before they express conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Okay? So these are the, this is essentially the problem. Let's start with the species and temperature uh, equation. Uh, again, assuming the fresh mixture is uniform. In other words, the temperature is constant and uh, very far in the fresh mixture is constant. Uh, this tells you that the material derivative is zero, which means every fluid particle move at a constant speed. Uh, at a, at a, the property remain constant. So if the temperature was Tu, it remained constant up to the flame, but not across the flame, because this is not satisfied across the flame. So up to the flame, T is a constant, and Y is a constant, and therefore it has to be Tu and rho U, uh, and Yu, and therefore rho is rho U. What about behind the flame? Well, the assumption is that along the flame, the flame temperature is the adiabatic temperature. Therefore, if it is the adiabatic temperature, every fluid particle uh, have, uh, as it moves, has, doesn't matter in what direction, has the same temperature, which is the adiabatic temperature. And therefore, T is, uh, T or the burn temperature is the adiabatic temperature. Density is obtained as a reciprocal, and the concentration is zero. Ta, the adiabatic temperature, is from what we know from before, is written here. So, on either side of the flame, the flow is inviscid to first approximation and of constant, by different, uh, of constant but to different density, rho u and rho b. And I think here come, uh, so the notation that I will use, which I used before, sigma is the ratio of density unburned to burn. Again, be careful. Sometimes in the literature, some people refer to sigma as the reciprocal of that, and some people refer to ratio minus one as thermal expansion. So you have to look at the definition carefully. In my notation, sigma will always be bigger than one. Okay? That's a thermal expansion parameter. Okay, I, I guess I don't see where my comment is. What I wanted to say is that it probably will come later somewhere. Uh, the equations are the inviscid equation, but, oh, just hold on. <laughs> I will come to that. So since the density is a constant here and a constant here, the continuity equation reduced to divergence v equal to zero. Uh, this is the Euler equation, the momentum equation. The Rankine-Nugonio relation have to satisfy cross that surface f equal to zero, and uh, the, propagate, uh, the flame speed is the laminar flame speed. So everything is well defined. We have a system of third order, uh, and uh, we have three boundary condition, and the fourth one determine either the flame position or the flame speed, it's equivalent. 
ah, this is the comment I want to make. Uh, you will see sometimes people say, oh, this is an incompressible flow. It is not, because the density is not constant. Through, I mean, the whole flow consists unburned and burned. So it is a variable density with a sharp discontinuity, but it is not a constant density flow. Of course, the divergence V is zero far away to the left, far away to the right in principle, and in this theory, it's on the left and on the right. Okay. So uh, the comment I made just a minute ago is that the flame speed is equivalent to a determining the flame position. And so uh, uh, the flame speed by definition is V dot N minus VF, the propagation speed relative to the flow, equal to SL. If you substitute for what the normal is, which is the gradient of F divided by its norm, and VF is the derivative of F with respect to time divided by the norm. Take the norm to the other side of the equation, you get this equation. Sometimes people call it the G equation. I don't know why, I don't know what caused that. Markstein wrote this in the 50s, much before G or any other symbol. Okay, so uh, the next comment before we proceed is to uh, discuss a little bit the rankine Gonio relation. So these are the rankine Gonio relations. Just to remind you, the uh, mass uh, flux in uh, towards the flame equal to the max, mass flux leaving the flame, the tangential velocity uh, uh, along the flame uh, is continuous, and uh, the, uh, this is the uh, momentum balance or the pressure change, if you like, uh, across the flame. Now, uh, by simple manipulation, using the fact that essentially V dot N minus VF on the unburned side is nothing but the flame speed, you can easily derive from this, this relation, which tells you that the jump in the normal velocity uh, is sigma minus one times SL. In other words, the burn gas velocity leaves the flame at a much higher speed uh, then uh, uh, it comes, by the way, sigma in reality is something like at least five, six, seven, eight, something like that. And so it's significant uh, change. The tangential component as before remain uh, uh, continuous, in other words, no jump. And the pressure jump is a small drop in pressure, uh, which is given by uh, uh, this relation, okay? So this is effectively the same, and so I will use this occasionally. Uh, just a comment, when you write the jumps, when it's equal to zero, it doesn't matter if it's unburned minus burn or burn minus unburn, but once you write the jump equal to something not zero, you have to be consistent. So in my notation, jump will always correspond to burn minus unburned, okay? The next uh, thing is, uh, if you have a, such a model, you have to examine it for the simplest flame problem that you have. The simplest one is the planar flame. So let's examine what it is. Divergence V equal to zero tells you U is a constant, so it has to be SL. Uh, this is now expressed relative to the flame, so the flame is stationary. And so, uh, in other words, since in a coordinate system attached to the flame, the same is at x equal to zero. So the incoming flow is just the laminar flame speed. To satisfy this jump, the burn gas should be sigma SL. Uh, the pressure on the, on, if you have gravity, by the way, I kept gravity, if you have, gra for now, uh, if you have gravity, then uh, what you have here is the hydrostatic uh, pressure which is with different density, as it should, and this is the drop in density uh, that occur even in the absence of, of gravity, which is this jump, okay? Uh, gravity does not change the Rankine-Nigonio relation, by the way. And uh, finally, you have the flame speed. It tells you that the incoming velocity should be exactly SL. So this is uh, the... Uh, planar flame, which is obtained as part of the solution. Uh, incidentally, just a minor comment, which I will use later, but later it will be probably Friday. Uh, for upward, uh, we, we have used the fact that gravity is downward, uh, so uh, the flame propagate, of course, uh, uh, downward in the same direction as gravity. So uh, if um, uh, 
uh, the flame propagate upward, what you have to do is change x to minus x, right? So the unburned uh, gas uh, is, uh, is here rather than here. Well, uh, at least for the planar flame, it's equivalent to changing g positive and negative. So in fact, those relations are correct uh, with g being positive downward propagation, negative being upward. It's a minor comment. It will come later at some point. So let's examine the meaning of those jump relations for a slanted flame, which is stationary. So velocity Vf is zero. Uh, the incoming velocity must V dot n must be SL. Let's say that the incoming velocity is here, the blue uh, arrow. So you can decompose it into a normal and tangential component. Now, the normal component should increase by a factor of uh, sigma, so the, um, the burn gas should be sigma times SL, so the jump is satisfied. The tangential component does not change, so I more or less make it the same length. And so what you see is that the streamline will get deflected, it get deflected towards the normal. So that's the nature of the gas expansion, that the streamline get deflected towards the normal. And you can, if you want, uh, with a little bit of geometry to play with the uh, equation to obtain the deflection relative to the angle theta, but uh, I will not discuss that. Okay, what about if the flame is now curved, is not uh, flat or is not, uh, as I said before? And uh, let's say that uh, the incoming velocity is uniform, so it's coming, uh, not, uh, sorry, uniform, it's unidirectional, so it's in one direction, but uh, it depends on y. So it's u of y. OK? And the, so uh, now the velocity is u of y for the unburned gas. The normal, uh, I can describe this surface as, say, x equal to f of y. So f of y, if we want, is uh, uh, the, at each x, it's the distance in this direction. Of course, you can write it as y equal to g of x or something like that. And uh, the normal clearly is going to be uh, the gradient. So it's 1 and minus f sub y, which is here. And so uh, the, you can evaluate uh, uh, so the flame speed relation, which is v dot n equal to sl, evaluated uh, at the flame, is going to be uh, the velocity v, so it's u dotted with this, so the v dotted with this, so it's u times 1. Uh, this is 0, so it's u divided by the norm, which is the square root equal to laminar flame speed. And uh, since uh, uh, this is the derivative respect to y, you can uh, uh, write uh, immediately, take it to the other side, get the, the f dy is that square root, okay, divided by 1 over sl. So uh, you can integrate this relation if you know the velocity u. So let's, uh, so when you integrate, you get f. Since f is x, so you can write x equal to x naught, the integral of u of y squared minus s squared. This is essentially will give you the flame shape uh, uh, in the xy coordinate. OK, let's uh, start with a simple example where Oh, OK, uh, just a comment. Uh, uh, I sometimes surprise myself. I see comments. Uh, <laughs> so um, the, the thing is that uh, uh, this is very nice uh, because the incoming flow is known, so, so you can obtain the flame shape in this condition. But what about the burn gas? That's difficult because you have to solve Euler equations. It's not uh, trivial always. OK. So uh, just a comment. So let's assume that the incoming velocity is uniform, like it will be in a Bunsen uh, burner flame. Then this is a constant u. Uh, when u is larger than SL, uh, what you obtain from this, uh, from the well, the integral is easily performed. Uh, I don't have to show you again the integral. It was u of y squared, the integral. And so uh, the integral gives you just y. And so it's two straight lines, OK? And so the, you can uh, describe uh, uh, the solution in terms of the opening angle, uh, which is the arc sine of SL over U. And uh, of course, uh, the flame is flat when uh, the angle uh, theta is pi over 2, which is going to be when the 
uh, incoming velocity is exactly the laminar flame speed. As you increase this, then it becomes sharper and sharper, and uh, that's what this uh, shows. Of course, uh, the solution fails at the tip and uh, near the burner. Uh, near the burner, because there will be some heat loss, which is not described here, and uh, near the tip, because you develop a sharp uh, corner, and uh, really the local behavior should uh, be important. Uh, putting it in terms of the initial assumption, in that region, delta is not very small, because the flame thickness is about the size of what that discontinuity is. But anyway, this is sufficient to describe uh, the Bunsen flame. Uh, you can, uh, the solution also doesn't tell you that the slope has to be like this, they could be like this. And in fact, that is also known experimentally as an inverted uh, or a V flame, inverted Bunsen flame, and it is stabilized by a rod, say, at uh, somewhere, or at the center of the burner, uh, that that stabilizes the flame, and then you get uh, two uh, straight, uh, more or less uh, straight lines. So here are experiment of a Bunsen flame. You see that the flame is pretty straight, and in fact, if you compare this to the description, to the theoretical uh, formula that I had before, you see that it's very close and very accurate. Uh, moreover, you see from this uh, nice experiment, which was uh, the gas was seeded with some particles that you here see the, uh, the, the, the streamlines and the incoming, the flow is uh, unidirectional. I don't know if he took a uniform flow or not. I think it looks from the figure it was a uniform flow. You will see in a minute why I'm saying that. And then uh, the streamlines are uh, diverted or deflected towards the normal as it should. And this is a V-flame taken by Choi and Puri. Uh, of course, uh, it will not sustain to infinity because there are, uh, I mean, the local behavior is what you expect, but not beyond. Uh, and this is an experiment taken from uh, know, an older book. I forgot uh, the, the, the name of the author, which I like quite a bit because there's some nice old uh, pictures. And this is show you uh, how uh, the, essentially the conical flame change as you uh, increase the uh, incoming flow, it becomes sharper and sharper. Well, there is some uh, two, two comments here to make uh, from this figure. One is when you reduce the speed to almost the laminar flame speed, you never get a flat flame, okay? And uh, the answer to this will come again on Friday. It's the hydrodynamic instability. The second comment to make here is that, remember that in the uh, expression, we had a square root of u square minus SL square. And uh, of course, uh, when, the square, when the quantity inside the square root is negative, it's meaningless, which means if the velocity is less than the laminar flame speed, that's not a good solution, right? So what happened in this condition is that uh, what we refer to as flashback, in other words, the flame try to, uh, and it's not a steady condition, the try, try to get into towards the, uh, the, the incoming flow, and that's a different thing. So here is another way to determine the laminar flame speed. Essentially, on a Bunsen flame, you, uh, you don't, uh, pay attention to the tip and uh, here, but you look at the center of the flame and using the formula that I uh, gave you, people have used to determine the laminar flame speed. Okay, uh, what if you now take a Poiseuille flow, not a uniform flow coming in? Well, the details are a little more difficult, but done. For you, square is going to and so, uh, and so, the, so this is the integral that you have to perform. Uh, you can rewrite that as uh, the fact, these two factors. Uh, you will see in a minute why I said that, and then you integrate. Uh, in principle, this integral can be written analytically in terms of elliptic function, but then it's uh, complicated to understand what it is, so you can either, if you want, you can do it numerically. 
but anyway, the key point here is that this factor should be positive and this factor should be positive for this to make sense, which means that the solution is uh, restricted to a point here to a point here. Why? Because below this, the incoming velocity is the normal component, or the incoming velocity is so small that the normal component is less than the laminar flame speed, and so clearly it's not going to uh, be possible to have a flame. So anyway, the flame is uh, like this. It has a little, uh, uh, it's a bit uh, curved uh, as opposed to the straight line before. And uh, if you assume that U is uh, very large, then you can even write a simple approximation of this form for, if you like, a slender flame. Okay, a quick point here that I want to make, which is uh, a paper which I think it's uh, somehow uh, not mentioned so much. It's by Uberoy. Uh, it was in physics of fluid in the, I don't know, what, 50-something. Um, uh, that uh, try to write uh, or to derive an expression for the vorticity production at the flame. In other words, uh, the incoming velocity could be potential or could be irrotational, no vorticity, but then some vorticity get created at the flame and the, uh, uh, well, for misalignment of uh, density gradient and pressure gradient primarily, but uh, which is Anyway, we, I don't want to expand on this, but uh, so th this is the equation he looked at. The convective term using vector identities could be written in this way. This is a gradient of uh, half V square minus V cross with omega. Omega is the uh, vorticity. And uh, since in two dimension the vorticity uh, is uh, only uh, uh, in the third direction, which is out of the paper or out of the blackboard, uh, then uh, it has only a, a, a single component with k being a unit vector in that direction. Anyway, uh, then you rewrite this equation, again, for steady condition, two dimension. Uh, you, can, um, uh, you can split this into normal and tangential component and then uh, evaluate uh, the, the, the equation on one side or the other of the flame. I'm not to discuss the detail, but what's interesting is that the vorticity uh, produced is given by uh, uh, rho u minus rho b, the change in density, the surface derivative or the derivative along the surface of the quantity vt squared, vt being uh, the tangential component of the velocity. I'm not sure that I will uh, be uh, using this given the time, but uh, anyway, this is uh, Oberoi 1958. Uh, the first example I want, I put that because I th think I will need it later. If I get to it, I will use it. If not, not. So this is, uh, uh, the first example I want to show you is a spherically expanding flame. This is a spherically expanding flame. You ignite it at the center and it remains a sphere for a sufficiently long time. Um, so as long as it remains a sphere, it's nice. Uh, the flame uh, separates the burned gas from the unburned gas. The flame is at a position uh, R that change in time. Of course, R increase in time. And uh, we can describe it by the hydrodynamic model very easily. The continuity equation is, is here, okay? And so it implies that rho v is a constant divided by r squared, okay? Since the velocity in the center must be finite, it cannot go to infinity, then the constant must be zero, and therefore the burn gas should remain at rest uh, in the, uh, inside that pocket. And then uh, from the remaining jump and the flame speed, you can derive uh, what the velocity will look like. The velocity will drop uh, uh, like one over r square, and uh, the speed is obtained as sigma times SL. In other words, the uh, uh, radius change uh, linearly like sigma SLT. By the way, this is very similar to what I showed you in the previous uh, um, in the previous lecture for a flame which is closed at one end, which is the same thing as that pocket. 
Uh, it's also uh, understood that uh, this is the propagation speed relative to the burn gas, and therefore it should be multiplied by sigma, which is the density ratio. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in the pressure change, you can very easily compute them from the equ uh, momentum equation, not interested. These are experiments done by Strello in, uh, in, uh, at the University of Illinois in 1969. And uh, what he showed here for propane air mixture of different uh, equivalence ratio uh, from lean to rich, uh, the propagation speed, r dot meter per second, as a function of the radius, which is equivalent to as a function of time, if you like, right? And uh, what you see is that eventually uh, these curves tend to some asymptote, and the asymptote uh, is uh, uh, about, uh, uh, should be about sigma SL, okay? It's, uh, that's uh, basically what I want to show you. Why is the asymptote different here, here, and here? Of course, because the equivalence ratio is different, and so the density ratio, which is related to the heat release by combustion, is different, and so clearly the asymptote is different. What I am not showing you in this uh, uh, theory, and it will come in the next lecture, why these curves sometimes uh, accelerate towards the asymptote, sometimes they decelerate towards the asymptote, okay? Sometimes they go up or down. So we'll see that next. So uh, this is, uh, again, uh, another uh, way to determine the laminar flame speed. Uh, you let the uh, sphere increase uh, sufficiently large until this asymptote is obtained, and this value it's uh, sigma over uh, sigma SL. You divide by sigma, you get SL. Every single uh, example that I say this is a way to determine laminar flame speed, there are of course pro and cons. I did not discuss them in every case. Uh, here is uh, I forgot. Here I, rem I remind myself. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes this flame develop instabilities, and so you cannot wait sufficiently long to determine this, and so that's a limitation, okay? Or there may be other limitations, such that uh, to obtain a spherical flame, sometimes it's done in a spherical bomb, and in a closed vessel, there is also some pressure buildup and some increase in flame temperature, some acceleration, and all these effects could affect your determination, okay? And there are some other minor things uh, to, to, to uh, determine. So, for example, one that I alluded to earlier in the lecture is uh, where do you, in an experiment uh, where the flame is not a discontinuity, where do you measure uh, the, the, the propagation speed? And it turned out that that's also an important and controversial thing. Some people measure it and believe that the results are uh, the, 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 the best, but turned out that, uh, well, they are also limited because they are done under some conditions, some other done other conditions. I am maybe exaggerating a little bit and or not to say that these uh, results are of no value. I am saying that you have always to be careful to what you have done, what's the pro and cons, what's the limitation. That's my key point here. Okay, the next thing is, you can describe an inward propagation. In other words, you have a mixture and you somehow ignite the flame. I don't know how you do it experimentally, frankly. Uh, you ignite the flame on a sphere and you let it uh, um, um, shrink. Uh, but mathematically, you have a solution. I think there was some discussion of this, but I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but uh, this is relevant to the tip that I told you earlier in the abundant flame that we did not uh, uh, describe properly because the tip here, uh, this is going to be unburned gas, and so it behaves very similar to a, an imploding flame, right? So that's... And you can also have a, a stationary flame if the... Uh, mixture or if the uh, mixture is, is uh, provided at a source, right, uh, at the origin. So if this is the source uh, has a mass flow rate m dot, uh, then uh, the solution is uh, given by, uh, as we have seen before from the continuity equation, like one over r square. So it decreases here, then there is a jump due to the increase in the normal velocity or the radial velocity 
and then it drops again. Uh, and uh, the position of the flame can be calculated, and this flame is totally stationary. It doesn't propagate, it doesn't, because the mass flow rate support that flame. And how do you obtain experimentally? Well, it's uh, you create a small porous burner, and there are some experiments done in this way, including, I think, some here at Princeton. Uh, you The mixture is provided through a thin tube, and then as it, as it leaves... Uh, uh, the, the, the porous sphere in a uniform manner, you establish uh, a spherical flame. Anyway, this just did. Uh, here is an important, interesting uh, thing that uh, you observe. As the flame uh, increases in size, okay, then it change its area, surface area. And so um, if the surface area is 4 pi r square of a sphere, then the time rate of change of the area relative to the area is going to be the derivative of this, which gives you a 2r dot, then uh, 4 pi r, divided by uh, 4 pi r squared. Anyway, you get 2r dot divided by r. So this is the relative area change of the flame surface, which is known in the literature as flame stretch. In other words, as the flame... Uh, propagate, it's being stretched more and more and more. Okay. In particular, uh, when K, uh, K will go to zero, when the flame is very large, essentially it approach, or at least locally, it approach a planar flame, and a planar flame that we discussed yesterday doesn't change its area, and so it's not stretched. But I'll comment on that again later. Uh, if it's a converging flame, it's, the stretch will be negative, so the stretch rate is negative, so it's being compressed, and that's what happened at the tip, for example, of the Bunsen flame, and the spherical flame stabilized at the point source, like the 1D planar flame, is not stretched. Okay. Uh, the next example, which I uh, unfortunately will have to minimize to about five minutes plus the three for replacing the <laughs> the batteries, uh, my batteries. Uh, so it's a counter flow where you have two mixture, in, in, uh, two, mixture uh, two jets impinging against each other. And so you can have different configuration using this thing. It's a very popular experiment. You have two burners, and the flow is coming, and then impinging against the other. It looks very nice in the picture, but I'm sure experimentally you have to make sure that they are perfectly aligned, that uh, all other things have to be perfectly right. Otherwise, you're not going to obtain what uh, I am describing here. So uh, if you have two mixture impinging against each other, you are likely to obtain uh, uh, twin flames, as we call them. Uh, if uh, it's a combustible mixture impinging against an inert gas, so you will get only one flame, and the inert gas can be made uh, to be hot at, uh, at, the, at the adiabatic temperature, for example, so you will have essentially a, a single planar flame, as if I would replace uh, this here, the center line, by a by a wall which is adiabatic. Okay, so you can have different configuration. And this is the example that I want to show you. Uh, you have a stagnation. Uh, this is referred to, of course, as a stagnation point flow. Uh, so the stagnation point is this. The incoming velocity is coming. Uh, no combustion at the moment. It's impinging against the wall. The velocity here is zero. Remember that we are in the, frame, uh, in the framework of Euler equation, so uh, the, there is no friction at the wall, so the velocity essentially goes along the wall, or it slips along the wall. In reality, there is a thin boundary layer here, and it's easy to compute it and to add it to the discussion. So I'm going to use uh, the situation in which you have a uh, axisymmetric configuration, so if you like the burner, whatever you have here is... Uh, is uh, cylindrical that uh, in, that provide the flow. Anyway, th what I wanted to show here is that this is the flow, the incoming flow in the absence of combustion. And uh, did I write what the question is? No, I did not, unfortunately. 
So the, if I write the, actually I'll write it here. If I uh, write the solution or the simple uh, velocity field uh, for, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, well, in the absence of combustion, which is here, uh, then uh, the uh, axial velocity u as a function of a distance would be just a straight line that go to zero uh, at, uh, at the stagnation point, okay? This is the mathematical solution of a stagnation point flow. In reality, of course, you have a burner, so the solution, uh, uh, if the burner, let's say, the flow coming at a uniform velocity, then it will come like that and it will go towards the, 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 the wall, uh, more or less at a straight line. And so the discussion is really uh, in this region which extends to infinity. In other words, if you compare experimental results, you have to look at conditions which are away from the burner, okay? Uh, so so uh, in the presence of the flame, uh, the flow does not go all the way to the wall. And so because of gas expansion, then uh, it looks like the stagnation flow get deflected somehow. In other words, if the blue curve where the flow that describe the stagnation point flow, uh, it will not be the same as what you will see in the presence of combustion because the flame, remember, is deflected towards the normal. The normal go in this direction, so the streamline get deflected towards the normal. So the uh, displacement effect here uh, is described by uh, this A. In other words, the incoming velocity is no longer uniform like here, but it has a displacement A. And uh, the vertical velocity is that. And then uh, you can compute the pressure. It's very easy to do that. So this is the incoming flow, the flow that you control that comes in. Now we want to compute the uh, flow in the burn gas. Well, things get a bit more complicated now, but uh, in this example, they can still be done. Remember I told you in one of the examples before that, uh, uh, that you have to solve Euler equation in the, in the burn gas. It's not always easy. Well, in this example, it was done. So uh, uh, you will see it next. But before I proceed, A is an unknown. But uh, due to the fact that the flame speed is equal to SL, there is a relation between the position of the flame and this displacement factor or displacement constant A, which is given by this. Neither of those is known yet. It's part of the solution that has to be discussed. So the burn gas, you have to solve Euler's equation subject to these jump conditions, right? The jump condition, ranking you go in your relation. Since we know the solution on the unburned gas, these jump conditions are effectively boundary condition for the burned gas. And uh, I told you that I use the Euboi relation for the jump in vorticity. By the way, there is uh, uh, in the literature a paper that described the jump in vorticity, not only for two-dimensional flame, even for three-dimensional flame and so on. So anyway, it's not the, so for the Uberoi case is just give you a relation for the jump in the vorticity. And so uh, what uh, uh, out of this Rankine Ingonio and this condition, we can get boundary condition for the burn side of the flame, U, V, and the vorticity. The reason I wrote this and I didn't write the pressure, it's because uh, to solve the equation, I want to use the so-called vorticity uh, stream function formulation, which is uh, simpler. Uh, and when you do that, and I know I'm skipping uh, the details, but it's not crucial, uh, what you get for the vorticity is a simple equation, R squared a function of Z, and you substitute in the equation, you get that uh, it's a quadratic function in Z. So the solution looks like this. The incoming flow, it's displaced, A. There is a flame here, and so the flame, the velocity, U is the actual velocity, which is like the normal. 
So there is a jump, and then it's go down quadratically to the stagnation point. So here is the solution. Uh, here is the position, the standoff distance, and this is the displacement. Sigma is the expansion ratio. Note that when sigma is equal to one, in other words, when there is no jump in uh, density, when the density ratio goes to one, it goes to zero, of course, as you expect. Uh, in fact, in fact, the flame position, I have one more slide, but it's an important one. So you will have to bear with me. And so, um, and so, uh, uh, where was I? Uh, but, no, it's not important. Uh, this is important, so here are uh, experiment. I mean, there are many other experiment. This is an early one uh, that was uh, uh, described by. Uh, actually, this uh, this is not the correct uh, reference. Is physics of fluid, not JFM. In case you are interested, uh, you see the jump in the velocity and the quadratic behavior. This is more recent experiment taken from a thesis uh, at uh, Caltech, uh, methane air. And uh, in fact, in this season, they compare with the expression that I wrote earlier, in, actually in a more elaborate one. Anyway, this is the last uh, uh, comment that, or one of the last slides I have, and the following. Um, let's look at a, a small section, small area along the flame, A of T. And what we want to calculate, the time rate of change of that area. Remember when we talked about spherical flame, we call that stretch. So we want to evaluate the stretch from a very fundamental way, okay? You compute the time rate of change of the area divided by A. So it's A at time T plus delta T minus A at T, right? A at uh, T, uh, A is essentially pi R squared, where R is the radius of that uh, fluid element, uh, or that section, or that uh, whatever. And so it's equal to pi uh, r plus uh, v delta t squared. And uh, this one is going to be pi r squared because the, the change in area due to the uh, tangential velocity uh, along the uh, surface. And so the increase in delta r is v delta t. And so that's what you see here. So when you expand this and divide by delta t, you take the limit, you get 2 pi rv, you divide by a, which is pi r squared, you obtain 2 epsilon. So the, did I use, yeah, I, I never mentioned before what epsilon was. Epsilon is essentially the strain rate of that flow, um, of this incoming flow. So epsilon is a, stra a strain rate, and uh, practically can be obtained as the, uh, you say, the incoming velocity divided by the distance from the burner. It's an approximation, but can be uh, practically obtained this way. It's essentially the slope of that line, so however you obtain it. Okay, so uh, what we see is that the flame, even though it's stationary, it doesn't propagate, is being stretched because the flow has a component uh, along the surface that uh, stretch it, okay? So we have seen two simple examples of flame stretch, and in the lex next lecture, we're going to see more about this. And uh, just uh, to fill in a little bit, it was later found, which will be discussed in the next lecture, that the flame speed is going to be the laminar flame speed with such a correction Namely, it's proportional to the strain rate multiplied by some coefficient, which is a mixture dependent known as the Markstein uh, length. And so it showed that the flame speed of that uh, stretched flame, which is in this counter flow, uh, is uh, 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 proportional to stretch in such a way that when the stretch goes to zero, it goes to the laminar flame speed, so again, it's a way to compute, uh, to uh, measure the laminar flame speed. You take measurement of this flame for different strain rate, and you extrapolate it uh, to zero strain, 
which gives you the laminar flames. As I mentioned earlier, any of these, uh, method, any of these uh, ideas have pro and cons, and so here too, uh, because uh, who said that uh, this uh, line goes straight, maybe goes a little bit down, a little bit up, or something else, and uh, there are always questions that you have to worry about and be concerned about. In fact, uh, that I just didn't make it up. There are some issues with this. Uh, let's stop here. I would appreciate if we can come back more or less on time, so I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot, I won't cut to the next lecture much. Okay, uh, I, I probably, uh, I don't know if I will finish on time or not, or stretch another five minutes or so, but uh, since uh, I'm gonna have lunch with you today, then we're all gonna suffer at the same rate, and so I can take the liberty to extend uh, as long as I want. So anyway, what we are gonna discuss now is, oh, didn't put it in a play mode, is the more advanced, if you like, I don't know what word to use, but the second order effect of the hydrodynamic theory. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the, although the flame is thin and uh, LF is small compared to L, as we discussed before, uh, the detail inside the flame have some significant effect on the way that the flame propagate. And so what uh, we are thinking of is a, a multi-scale analysis. In other words, uh, we have, in fact, if you want, it's more than multi, it's, uh, there are, well, multi is more than one, so it's fine. So there is a, a flame zone and there is a reaction zone. The reaction zone is LR, uh, uh, L reaction, there is a flame zone. The reaction zone is thin, but is embedded within the entire flame, and the entire flame is thin compared to some hydrodynamic length, okay? And so typically, uh, uh, LF is a fraction of uh, uh, a millimeter. Sorry that things have moved. Uh, the reaction zone will be a factor of two smaller, and, uh, you know, L, uh, say the hydrodynamic length is a few centimeter, so the assumption will be that uh, delta is small, and of course, uh, delta beta minus one, it's smaller, okay? Now, uh, uh, so th these are the two assumptions done, and uh, uh, everything that I discussed last time is about the, the describing the flame remain the same, uh, the only difference is now that we are not assuming that the local flame speed is a laminar flame speed, but rather we are going to describe all the diffusion and uh, uh, conduction, viscous effect that occurring within the flame and obtain a more uh, accurate uh, uh, result uh, uh, for the flame speed and the jump relation across the flame. And uh, this, I should say, uh, let's see what comes first. So how does the flame propagate depend on the local flow and mixture condition was the question that I posed uh, earlier uh, in the previous lecture. And uh, I said, and I'm repeating, Darian Landa assumed that the flame speed propagated at a constant speed. And we have seen that we can learn quite a bit from this uh, uh, assumption or from this model. Uh, Remember, I said in my first lecture, there is no, to my knowledge, uh, problem in combustion that you can have an, an, an exact solution unlike uh, many exact solution in fluid mechanics. So every simple problem need a model, and that's, if you like, it's a model, but it's a systematic model because there is no ad hoc assumption in it, They're all uh, derived in a systematic way. So uh, this was Darian Liner. Markstein assumed that the speed is proportional to curvature with a constant or a coefficient, uh, which at the time it was a phenomenological parameter that uh, he uh, uh, understood clearly because it was, as I said, it was a brilliant idea. 
uh, that uh, uh, it will depend on the flame thickness. In other words, it will be proportional to the flame thickness and proportional to the effect co occurring inside. And then uh, there were rigorous uh, studies in the 80s that examined the flame structure in other words, that derive all the detail or solve all the detail equation inside the flame analytically uh, to determine uh, the condition. The main focus of these studies at the time were on flame instabilities, and it started with uh, a paper by Clavin Williams in JFM 1982, where uh, to try to address the flame structure, they assume that the flame is very weakly curved. In, in other words, it's like almost planar. It's a perturbation from plane. And they assume that the flow is nearly uniform. In other words, it's a perturbation from a uniform flow. Uh, then uh, came studies interested in stability. And there were uh, three papers in, that, uh, in, in, in this context. Uh, uh, the first uh, was, uh, one of them is Pelsin and Clavin uh, in JFM 82, all of them in 82. Uh, the other one by Frankel and Sevashinsky in 82, and uh, then the third one. So the first two, uh, what they were, again, interested in flame stability, they say, okay, let's uh, look at the equation, linearize them, because you do a linear stability analysis, you assume that the perturbation are small, you linearize the equation, you get some linear equation, and you discuss them for stability. Unlike uh, this approach, the third paper have uh, approached the problem differently. We say, well, uh, we have this multi-scale analysis. Let's first derive a model, not necessarily for small perturbation, and then examine small perturbation based on this model. The advantage of this is that uh, we don't use only the linearized equation, but when you linearize the model, you obtain the same stability uh, result as uh, the other two papers. By the way, some people made comment to me at least uh, more than once that, oh, the results are different. That's not true. The three paper, and I can assure you this, I have done it more than once, the three papers give exactly the same answer, just different approach, different notation, different things. Anyway, so the, this is one, uh, ad, so the advantage of the last one is that, first of all, the model is nonlinear, and second, it's written in a coordinate free form. So it doesn't apply only for a perturbation for a plane, it may apply for a spherical, and in fact, there were results done on spherical flames using this uh, model. And in fact, the, the discussion on Friday in my last lecture on turbulent flames will also be based on this model. So um, this is one effect. The other thing, it's nonlinear, so you can learn flame flow interaction, as I said, even in, in the turbulent flames. And uh, as a third general comment, which is really not quite accurate, it's only here because there was a paper by, uh, which I did not uh, quote, by. Uh, uh, Clavin and Nicoli, which uh, they uh, also addressed, again, within the stability uh, uh, context, uh, added the temperature-dependent transport on the result. So uh, the point here is that the theory uh, accounts for temperature-dependent transport, uh, non-unity and distinct Lewis number for the fuel and oxidizer. In other words, the theory accounts for two reactant mixture effect due to stoichiometry uh, and, in other words, its span from lean to rich, and reaction order. In fact, you can account for different reaction order if you want. I'm not sure that I will have in my slides uh, all these effects. I may mention them, but uh, I will probably simplify for the discussion. So the idea, again, is that uh, there is a boundary layer here, which is, uh, which uh, even though in many uh, discussion uh, we exclude it. Uh, the idea is it's the same as when you uh, talk about the flow past uh, a, a, a plate or a wing. Uh, you discuss the inviscid flow and you add the effect of the boundary layer as, if you like, boundary condition on the surface of the object. So it's the same thing here. Uh, we discuss the outer flow and we add conditions which describe the detail of the flame uh, on that surface that represent the flame surface. 
So the equations in this region were derived, and they led to uh, some uh, uh, improvement in the, uh, uh, ex in the different expression. Now in the limit, when delta goes to zero, the entire boundary layer shrinks to the surface, similar to what I earlier discussed, with unburned burned gas at different density, because it's the same idea as before. Uh, F equal to zero describe the surface, and the boundary layer inside the flame provide velocity and pressure jumps across the flame surface uh, as uh, effectively matching condition. In other words, those are conditions that should match with the flow outside, and uh, an equation for the flame speed. So this is the whole idea, and here are essentially the result. Um, uh, the perturbation or the addition terms include uh, a, a small effect of viscosity, which in the earlier analysis today were neglected, some uh, uh, correction to the rankine hugonio jumps, which I will explain in a minute, and uh, this additional term uh, in the flame speed, which, as you will see, uh, in fact, I use already that notation. It's related to flame stretch with a coefficient here, uh, which is known as the Markstein uh, length. Uh, I will talk about this in, uh, in, uh, uh, in detail. So the asymptotic theory, which is, strictly speaking, it's only valid for weakly stretched flame. I say strictly speaking because sometimes the same structure or the same behavior it turned out to be valid even when it's not uh, uh, exactly so. But the theory doesn't tell you yes or no. That's the key point here. And the general dependence, it shows general dependence on flow and mixture condition in general is not known. It's known for weakly stretch flame. That's the extent of uh, uh, the knowledge today from the theoretical point of view. Uh, of course, there are attempts sometimes to uh, uh, obtain such dependencies uh, in simulation or in uh, different numerical study, which are very important, very valid, because they can also give ideas how to develop a theory and so on. But remember, the difference is that when you do that in a particular setup, it's only true for those particular conditions. And how do you extend this in a more general setting is not always obvious. Okay, uh, the, the thing I wanted to discuss is the jump relation. So the focus is on the hydrodynamic flow. Uh, the, this is a summary of what you've seen before. So there is viscous effect are important, but they are small. And then the order co delta contribution in the jump relation, they are explained as such. You see, the rankine ugonio relation tells you that the mass flux in uh, must be equal to the mass flux out, and out of this we saw that there is a velocity jump that whatever comes in increased by a certain factor, okay? Uh, but when the flame has a certain thickness, think of this to be your control volume. Whatever go in well can be accumulated for some time or can be transported transversely, and that is the those additional correction to the rankine ugonio relation, okay? And then uh, the flame speed. I'm, I wanna just, before I talk about the flame speed, I wanna uh, say something about what I just said before. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, the only place that uh, this correction to the jump relation um, uh, were accounted for were in uh, stability studies because those are linear equation and it's easy to, uh, uh, to, to incorporate them. Uh, but in many other studies that, uh, and that's true for stability of planar as well as spherical flame, but uh, when uh, some of the more numerical studies based on the hydrodynamic model, they were just simply neglected because it become a cumbersome problem <laughs> and so, uh, up to today were not included. However, I have shown in uh, one of my paper, a review paper on the Dario Landau instability, that really the only major effect of these uh, uh, small changes in the uh, Rankine-Ugonio condition 
is uh, just to shift a critical Markstein number, which have important result, but it's a small shift. So it's not the major thing, but uh, there may be consequences. Uh, not sure about that. OK, so the main thing that we want to focus is on the flame speed. Uh, flame speed is a laminar flame speed plus this flame stretch, which have units of one over time. Uh, it's uh, a measure of how uh, the flame deform, and we have seen two simple examples earlier today. And a coefficient here, which is known as the Markstein length uh, in, in, in attributing to his earlier study of this problem. But unlike Markstein, this is not only curvature, but it's more than curvature. Um, OK. So, and uh, the Markstein length, it's uh, someone once asked me, so that's why I want to emphasize this. It's not a length. It's just a quantity or a parameter that have units of length. So it can be positive, it can be negative. Someone asked me, okay, why is your marks in length negative? So that's the answer. OK, so uh, I want to talk about uh, this in quite uh, a little length next. Before doing this, I want to go back to remind you that the flame speed is equivalent to an evolution equation that describe uh, the, the location of the flame or this uh, interface function f, okay, which is now going to be uh, incorporating the effect of stretch. And so this quantity uh, depends also on the flow field as well as this quantity. Okay, so let's uh, first uh, talk about flame stretch. And uh, more or less the idea was described in some of the earlier uh, examples that I did. But now we have a surface, a general described here. Uh, at, uh, if we take a surface element A of T, at a later time due to either propagation or due to the velocity field which uh, may have components along the uh, surface to the flame, uh, will uh, change into a, a slightly different area A at T plus delta T. And so we want to calculate the time rate of change of A. We take the difference divide by delta t, take the limit, divide by a, and compute stretch. And uh, we eventually obtain uh, uh, this uh, two form of the same relation. So it tells you that uh, the stretch is the propagation speed multiplied by the curvature minus n dotted with the curl of v cross n. It's easy to show that uh, what this term in intrinsic coordinates, which are uh, normal and tangential to the surface, uh, just to uh, uh, point out that when you talk about intrinsic coordinates, normal and tangential to the surface, so this is the normal, this is, say, in 2D, the tangential. Of course, at different position, the normal change. So this is a, not a trivial coordinate system, but one that you have to be careful because changes uh, incorporate, for example, divergence or gradient, uh, divergence in particular, incorporate the curvature, the local curvature of that surface. So, but anyway, the point here is that uh, this term is the surface gradient of the, surf of the velocity component along the surface. My battery. Oh, I forgot to. Thank you. Um, so, so, where was I? Yeah. So, uh, this is the. Uh, so, in two dimensions, it tells you it's the gradient along the surface. Uh, in three dimensions, it's a little bit more complicated, but that's what it is. So this and this is equivalent. This is a surface dilatation due to the fact that the flame propagate, and so it's curvature change. And this is a surface extension due to the velocity gradient. Uh, curvature, by the way, uh, in principle, it's the sum. We use the word curvature. More precisely, it's really the mean curvature. Uh, every surface has two radius of curvature or two principal radius of curvature. For example, a cylinder 
one of the radius of curvature is the radius of the cylinder, and the other one is uh, infinity. And so, uh, uh, and so the the curvature is the sum of the two. And uh, an easy way to compute curvature is taking the divergence of the uh, normal vector to the surface at the surface, of course. Um, uh, remember that I said that in all my you will see sometimes people write curvature, divergence, and I write it minus. It's not just uh, as you wish. It's consistent with the convention that you use where is the normal directed towards, okay? So my normal directed toward the burn gas, and that's my, uh, the definition consistent with this. Another point to make is that uh, the stretch as defined so far is uniquely and unambiguously defined in this asymptotic limit. Why? Because in this asymptotic limit, the, um, the, the, the surface or the velocity component along the surface to leading order is conserved. And therefore, this quantity, which appear in the order delta effect, is always the same. Uh, uh, whether you compute it on the unburned side or on the burned side. So there is no discontinuity, if you like, in this uh, 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 stretch or in this. And the second thing to mention is that because in this hydrodynamic limit, the flame has a unique surface that is identified in the limit when delta goes to zero, stretch is associated with that surface, okay? And not with anything else. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the two examples that we have seen before, this is one we evaluated the stretch directly from its definition. Well, it's, uh, of course, it satisfied the relation which I wrote above. Uh, the flame propagation is R dot, uh, minus because it's moving, uh, against the normal, and the normal in this case points to the burn gas, which is negative uh, the radial direction. Uh, the curvature is 2 over r. Uh, there is no, the flow is radial. There is no tangential component to the flame surface. So this part is 0, so it comes from here. So the first term essentially gives you this. Second example with the stagnation point flow, we again calculated it using uh, the exact definition. We now compute it from here. The flame is stationary, so it doesn't propagate. Vf is zero. And so you compute the, uh, the, the gradient of the, uh, of, the ra of the radial velocity. And so it's, uh, well, it's not the gradient. It's the divergence of V sub s. And so it's given by uh, uh, this expression, which is exactly 2 epsilon, since you know the incoming velocity and you know the vertical velocity. So just to show you that those are two simple cases that fall into this. In a more uh, com complicated uh, uh, or curved surface, um, uh, let's uh, focus first on the first term. The first term is the normal, due to the normal propagation. So we see segments like this where the curvature is negative, right? Because you see the normal is pointing toward the burn gas. The radius of curvature is in the other direction. So it's negative, or if you compute divergence uh, uh, n. Uh, you, uh, and the propagation speed is uh, uh, here minus Vf. And so minus Vf times kappa is, uh, uh, is uh, negative, minus Vf is positive. And so, um, uh, and so this uh, uh, segment is compressed, whereas um, uh, this segment is stretched by this, again, by, you know, by, the, by the tendency to propagate. So this is similar to an outwardly or inwardly propagating spherical flame, uh, concave, com convex, co co correspond to compressed or stretch or negatively stretch and positive. What about the second term? Well, the second term is due to velocity uh, uh, gradients uh, along the surface. So a region like this where the gradient diminish, as I show in the, say, in the blue arrows, uh, the divergence here of Vs is negative. 
And so uh, this is uh, uh, compressed, as you see, the velocity uh, get smaller and smaller, and so it be compressed. And uh, the other one is being stretched, okay? Maybe I drew the arrow incorrectly, but that's what I meant. Uh, okay, so these are the two effects. Now, uh, sometimes uh, uh, you can express this relation in a different way. So, for example, you can take vector identities and open up this, uh, this term here, curl of V cross N. Curl of V cross N, uh, it's identical to the four terms uh, written on top. If you dot it with N, uh, you get from the first term, which is the strain rate dotted with N on both sides, okay? So it's a scalar because it's a, say, a matrix times a vector times a matrix gives you a vector dot product of two vectors, a scalar. That's the first term. The second term is zero uh, because you have add N dotted with the gradient of N. You can verify it. The third term is divergence N, give you curvature multiplied by V dot N after you multiply by dot N, and so it's the normal velocity. And uh, the last one, N dot N is one, it's divergence V. So an equivalent relation to this is what you see here, where uh, E is the rate of strain uh, tensor, which is something you would obtain if you know the flow field or when you compute the flow field. And uh, the combination of uh, the, 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 this term and this term, which are here, it's minus the propagation speed kappa plus V dot NK. Well, the, the sum of these two, it's the flame speed times kappa. So uh, uh, you can sometimes express uh, flame stretch as uh, a combination of uh, curvature multiplied by the flame speed. In fact, it should be the flame speed, not the laminar flame speed, but that's an approximation which is consistent in the uh, hierarchy of the terms that we have kept. So this is correct. It's asymptotically correct, but that's one. But uh, plus the strain rate, but that's provided uh, divergence V is equal to zero. But in the theory, uh, hydrodynamic theory, divergence V is indeed zero, and so it's equivalent to that. So sometimes uh, people uh, use flame stretch as a combination of curvature and hydrodynamic stretch. Be careful that if it's not the hydrodynamic limit, then uh, this may contribute something to your quantity. It's not clear then how you compare uh, the result to the theory. Here is an example. This is the DNS done on a spherically expanding flame, and uh, what you see here is the temperature in blue, uh, no, in the solid uh, black. The blue is exactly the asymptotic result, which uh, show a nice comparison, and uh, what you see here is the divergence of V, okay? So, it's clear that when you go sufficiently far to the burn side, well, when you go on the burn side, divergence V is zero, okay, because the density is nearly constant, the burn gas, and when you go sufficiently far to the right, uh, it's also equal to zero. So this region from about 33 to 36 in radius scaled with respect to the delta T, which is the flame thickness, um, is approximately where the flame is. And uh, uh, here uh, are a different evaluation of the stretch um, uh, uh, in different position within the flame. And you see the flame is described where the temperature go from the unburned one to the burned seven. So this is the region where it correspond to from here about to here, so it's the same region where the flame is. Now, uh, note that the divergence is not zero within the flame, which is clearly, uh, which is clear because the flame has uh, uh, some thickness and numerically was evaluated quite precisely. And, um, um, okay, so now, if you evaluate stretch based on the uh, initial definition that I gave you or initial expression I gave you, it's a black curve. It's here, you don't see it. 
it's uh, unique because it have the same value here and as well as here. If you evaluate stretch based on uh, uh, curvature and strain, well, because the divergence is not zero, then uh, you get this blue curve, which is true at this end and at this end, but in between you get something uh, which is due to the divergence V. Actually, it's exactly that quantity that you see there. Now, if you eliminate divergence V by, for example, forcing it to be zero when you evaluate stretch from this relation, then you get again the circles that you see, which is a unique value. So this is just to show you that when you make comparison to simulations, same thing if you do comparison experiment, well, you have to be careful. If you're not consistent with the theory, you may get things which are not necessarily uh, uh, consistent. Okay, uh, 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 here I want to show you that this uh, 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 relation, right, that uh, you can express it as curvature and strain is also true for those uh, simple cases that we have discussed before. Uh, for example, for his, so here is the expression. Again, I am now in the hydrodynamic theory, so I don't have to worry about divergence v equal to zero or not. It is zero on either side. So uh, if I compute the strain rate, the strain rate has only one component, which is the ERR component. Uh, that's the strain rate. You dotted with n and n and so on. You evaluate it and you get sigma minus one over sigma, two r dot over r. In other words, the flame uh, is being strained and the strain is only a radial contribution to the strain. And then uh, curvature is two over r and when you multiply uh, curvature, when you add curvature to strain, uh, you see the, the, the constant uh, one uh, here, what, what happened? Uh, this get eliminated, uh, the one over sigma, because R is sigma SL, and you get two R dot over R. Anyway, you, you can verify it. Um, uh, if you take a stagnation point flow, then uh, there is no curvature, the flame is flat, and so the only contribution comes from strain, and the only strain component is EZZ, which is two epsilon, and so that gives you the relation. All I wanted to show you is what, when you are consistent with the theory, you compute it this way, compute it that way, you get the same result. One of the nice things that uh, some of the uh, ex experimentalists has found uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, this relation, uh, it's a coordinate free relation. In other words, you can apply it to any geometry. So if you can measure V just ahead of the flame and you can uh, determine, say, the normal because you know the surface and uh, you can compute kappa, you can easily evaluate stretch uh, from it directly. Uh, if you have to measure strain rate, I don't know, I think it's more complicated, but uh, I don't know. I can easy, easily invent experiment, but it's theoretical experiment, uh, a la Taylor. Taylor, G.I. Taylor had beautiful experiment that he had done them all in his kitchen, I think. Well, not quite. He did it in the lab, but his experiment did not involve any very fancy uh, equipment, he could uh, do very simple experiment and get, uh, you know, beautiful results. Um, uh, you can evaluate uh, the stretch rate from any relation that you like. This is an, an example I showed in this paper. For example, a, conic, a, a cone which may represent, uh, you know, a Bunsen flame, say, and you obtain that uh, uh, stretch is given by u over 2r sine 2 alpha, where alpha is this opening angle, so the flame is always negatively stretched or compressed. Uh, and uh, anyway, so this is the flame speed, uh, flame stretch. Now, there was a coefficient in front of flame stretch, which is the Markstein number, and so the, as I told you, uh, everything was obtained from the detail analysis or calculation within the flame. And so this is the expression that came out of the uh, analysis for the Markstein length, for that coefficient. It can be positive or negative. 
Uh, I will talk about that in a minute. It depends on sigma, which is the thermal expansion parameter or the density ratio, or the heat release, right? It's equivalent. Uh, it's proportional to the flame thickness, LF, which depends on thermal diffusivity of the mixture. Uh, it depends on the activation energy parameter, uh, yes, but not so much. Uh, and it depends on the uh, Lewis number, and I wrote here effective Lewis number, because remember, we have a mixture that has both fuel and oxidizer, and so they would, they, they turned out that uh, mathematical analysis give you a coefficient or a, a, a Lewis number, which is a combination of the two. And that combination I called effective. Effective does not mean that it was made up. It was calculated or computed. And so the effective Lewis number, as you will see, it's a weighted average of individual Lewis number. And, um, and so this is the expression. Uh, this is, by the way, a definite integral, so it depends on sigma. So the, it's very straightforward to determine this. Now, uh, if the effective Lewis number is positive, then this is positive and this is positive. It's easy to show that the integral is also positive, so it's a positive number. Uh, but when the effective Lewis number is sufficiently less than some critical number, which is not too big, then uh, this can become negative as well. So depending on the effective Lewis number, this can be positive or negative. Uh, the Markstein lengths can be controlled by different things. So in fact, it accounts for different things. It's like a lump parameter that uh, 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 can be changed by different things. Can be controlled by the pressure level because it's proportional to the flame thickness. So if the pressure level in the uh, in, in, the, in the field uh, is increased, the flame thickness is decreased, the Markstein length is decreased. It can be affected by the thermal diffusivity of the mixture, as you see from here. can be affected by the heat release, which is sigma. Can be related, it can be affected by the different diffusivities of the fuel and oxidizer because uh, the diffusivities of the fuel and oxidizer, remember that in the theory we are using a binary diffusivity, which is diffusivity relative to the uh, inert, or to the bulk. So you dilute the mixture differently, you change your Lewis number, you change the diffusivities. Uh, and so this is the, uh, also, and it depends on the equivalence ratio, because that uh, you will see so how the effective Lewis number is obtained, and it depends somewhat on the activation energy as well. Uh, as I said earlier, I said just a minute ago actually, it can change sign, and I call the critical value uh, L, L E star, so and L star is less, less, should be less than one. So when you cross this effective number, the Markstein length change sign. Um, uh, the effective Lewis number of a mixture is obtained uh, from this relation. So it's a combination of the Lewis number of the oxidizer and the fuel, fuel and oxidizer. This is for a lean mixture. This is for a rich mixture, where uh, this phi tilde, it's the deviation from one. In other words, it's how much lean or how much rich it is. So uh, when phi is equal to one, this is two, uh, and this is... Uh, what is it? When phi, oh, I'm sorry. When phi is equal to one, phi tilde is zero. In other words, when you are at stoichiometry, there is no deviation. So this is zero, this is zero. It's just exactly the average. So at stoichiometry, it's the mean of the two. But when uh, phi tilde become large, say if you are uh, very lean in the first relation or very rich in the second relation, uh, well, you will see when it's very large, the one is negligible compared to that, and the two is negligible compared to this, and so the effective, and this is negligible because this is large, so the effective Lewis number is the fuel. So in a very lean mixture, it's the fuel that dictates things. In a very rich mixture, it will be the oxidizer that dictates things. In between, there is an effective number that 
weight more towards the deficient component, and at stoichiometry, it's the exact the average. And uh, one uh, here can uh, show example. Uh, so uh, here is the Lewis number of the fuel, which was determined as 1.81, based on the idea that if you put the fuel into a, a bulk, uh, say, of, uh, I think it was air, so it's nitrogen, so the Lewis number uh, being deficient will be uh, 1.81 for propane. And uh, on this end, I don't know why there is no number there. It should be. Uh, sorry, uh, it's supposed to be the Lewis number for air, uh, which is uh, approximately a, a little less than one, about 0.9 or so. And so uh, those are the two numbers that would appear uh, in this uh, expression. Lewis number of fuel, Lewis number, because based on the way that the theory was developed, those where uh, the theory was developed using fixed law. And fixed law uses only one uh, uh, fuel, uh, I mean one component relative to the bulk. And so Lewis number of the fuel is the fuel relative to the bulk. Lewis number of oxidizer is the oxidizer is the bulk. And for the effective one, you take uh, those two extreme value and you construct the, um, uh, the, the value in between. Uh, just the, the, there was, a, uh, well, okay, I was going to say an anecdote, but I'll skip it. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, if you take hydrogen, for example, then the Lewis number of the fuel is quite low for the hydrogen in, uh, in, uh, in nitrogen, and uh, the Lewis number of the oxidizer uh, is, uh, is about this value. And uh, um, uh, again, you have to be sensitive. That's really what I was going to say in a different way, but you have to be sensible how you determine those extreme value. I mean, you cannot just take numbers without being thinking about what they represent. So anyway, uh, then uh, what you see is that the Markstein lemma increases uh, as opposed to for propane, it decreases, okay? From, uh, and you can take any uh, effective number for any equivalence ratio, and uh, what else? Oh, and uh, you see the dependence on activation energy is not really very big. Uh, this, this was just to show you that when you scale it with respect to uh, LF, uh, you get what is referred to as a Markstein number, and uh, then uh, for different uh, combustible mixture either decrease or increase. So it has different behavior depending on the mixture. Uh, and uh, this I will skip, but I just mentioned that if you now want to account for the temperature dependence of the, uh, uh, and the temperature dependent diffusivity conductivity, remember in one of the lecture yesterday, the day before, I showed you that uh, all the, when, all the different diffusivities, the ratio gives you Prandtl number, Lewis number, which is appro approximately constant. So the temperature dependence is sufficient. All of them confined to one law, which I called lambda of t. And so depending on that law lambda of t, you will get an expression which is a little bit more elaborate than the previous one. And the effective Lewis number, of course, will depend on that. This is an integral here, so it's a detail, but it's not important. Okay. Uh, we have uh, uh, always looked at the flame relative to the unburned gas. And therefore, uh, the Markstein length was relative to, or at least uh, the flame speed was relative to the unburned gas. Of course, one can write the flame speed relative to the burned gas. And so to add confusion, I want to mention to you that uh, in uh, all the Russian literature, at least uh, I think even currently, uh, they use flame speed relative to the burn gas as opposed to uh, most uh, of the people on the, this side uh, of the ocean. Well, I should say not this side of the ocean, more, uh, unless uh, the um, Western world. Uh, <laughs> 
it's maybe not politically correct, I don't know, <laughs> used relative to the unburned gas. So be careful again when you read things, uh, what is the definition. So if you, if you use a flame speed relative to the burn gas, then the flame speed will have to be multiplied by sigma, the density ratio, and so the Markstein length also is a little different. And uh, you will see if you compare the two expressions that this term is the same like before, but in this term there is a sigma missing. Uh, anyway, uh, the two are not identical. Here is the difference between the two. Just uh, mention, is that just a comment to mention? Uh, yeah, flame speed, flame stretch relation uh, was examined uh, uh, experimentally. So if the flame is positively stretched, uh, then uh, it depends on the Markstein lengths whether the flame speed increase or decrease. And so uh, here is a propane air mixture. Uh, those are, I think, calculation. I'm not sure if they are experiment, don't remember. It's taken from uh, Ed Law's book. Uh, and uh, one thing also, I am not 100% sure, I discovered this after I put the slides on. I'm not sure what he meant by this uh, speed relative to what? Not relative to the burn gas, but I, I don't know. But it doesn't matter. The idea is the fact that uh, since the flame is positively stretched, uh, it depends on the Markstein uh, lengths. And for lean propane air mixture, the Lewis number is sufficiently large. And so the Markstein lengths is positive, And so the slope is uh, uh, negative, as you see here. But uh, for uh, RIT, uh, no. And the slope is negative, right, as you see here. <laughs> and then for uh, rich propane air, the Lewis number is, uh, should be that close to oxidizer or the oxygen, which is, uh, I told you earlier, it's about 0.1, less than 1. And so the slope is uh, positive because it makes this positive. So this is consistent. Uh, and uh, for hydrogen, because uh, it's exactly the opposite, as I showed you in the earlier slide, then you get exactly the opposite trend. Uh, you see, the reason I said I'm not sure, because he called it SB0CFF, and I didn't have time to look what CFF means and the zero means and so on. But you can verify. Anyway, the idea is that this trend was experimentally verified. Uh, in, uh, if, you, if we revisit now the spherically expanding flame, uh, the previous slide uh, or the previous lecture, we had only the first term, and now we have a correction here which is proportional to the flame thickness uh, for the velocity, but the more important is the propagation speed. And so you see the propagation speed because now the propagation speed is relative to the burn gas. So it's natural that the uh, Markstein lengths, the burn, sort of called burn Markstein lengths appear. But anyway, you see that it's, there is a correction here. So it's no longer this asymptote that I showed you earlier today, sigma SL. And so, uh, and so um, uh, uh, just to remember, that uh, this term is proportional to stretch, which means is when the flame is more stretched, which means that the correction term, it's the early time of the propagation, and the leading term is the longer time of the propagation. So uh, this is the way to properly interpret the result. And so uh, if we uh, use this uh, formula, we see uh, that the curves sometimes uh, accelerate towards the asymptote, sometimes decelerate. It depends, uh, and, uh, the dent and the trend is very similar, almost equivalent to the result that I showed you before by Strello. So it's not just the asymptote that you obtain. Now the theory tells you whether uh, you approach the asymptote from above or from below. So in lean propane air mixture, for example, that's what uh, this experiment were. Uh, the burn Markstein is positive, and the flame accelerates as it grows larger. So this is uh, uh, the all the red. Uh, well, it's not the red, it's lean. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, now I said lean and rich. Uh, what's interesting, and uh, 
uh, remember that the, 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 the cross between positive marks and Lang's negative marks was not Lewis number equal to one, was some Lewis number effective a little bit less than one, I call LE star. So uh, loosely speaking, we often say Lewis number bigger than one, you have this behavior, Lewis number less than one, you have this behavior, but strictly speaking, it's not really bigger than one, it's less than a critical value. And what you will see here is that, in fact, the critical value is about uh, uh, equivalence ratio 1.3, okay? And that's consistent with the calculation based on the formula and the experiment. And this is, uh, <laughs> this is an interesting uh, result. Uh, it was done in Aachen uh, by uh, Bickman and uh, Norbert Peters, uh, Heinz Peach. I visited, that's, uh, I visited there at some point and they were telling me the theory doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? We don't get results that are not comparable. So we sat down and we tried to see why, what is the deviation between what they have computed and what I thought the theory is. And it takes time to compare these things. Now, this is a message that I've been trying to keep on repeating. You have to be always consistent with the assumption that you make, and then you have a good comparison. So we discussed it in the morning, and we went to lunch, and after lunch, they apparently sent a student to do the calculation. I don't know who the student. I'm sure it's one of the uh, authors in this paper that we have jointly. Unfortunately, it's the uh, last paper with Norbert Peter. Uh, the, the after lunch, they say, it works. So we were all very happy, and this is the result why it works. <laughs> so these are the experiment, and this is from the theory, and uh, it works. But it worked uh, also about it was not just limited to this, it was also limited, uh, uh, obtained some uh, instabilities that result in this case. Okay. I did not say anything about flame temperature until now, except in the previous lecture, I told you that the assumption of, uh, based on the Dario and Landau study, was that the flame speed is the laminar flame speed and the flame temperature is the adiabatic flame temperature. Now, it the, turned out that the, the theory was derived, and so at some point you can also calculate the flame temperature. And so there is a, an, an, an equation for the flame temperature, and the, the result is what you see here. The flame temperature is the, different than the adiabatic temperature by, actually this is the flame temperature, but the, the point here is that the correction is an order delta times beta minus one. And the whole uh, computation of, uh, say, of the flow field and the flame speed is up to order delta. So in that respect, for that calculation, you don't need to incorporate this effect because it's much smaller and we have to keep being systematic in our study. But, by, by, but it gives us an expression that we can still examine and compare to simulations and this is what it is shown. So what is interesting is that the adiabatic temperature for a, a lean condition depends only on the Lewis number of the fuel. For rich condition, it depends on the Lewis number of the oxidizer. And actually, for uh, uh, exactly very close to stoichiometry, it's something in between, and I will show you in a minute. So uh, uh, the conclusion is, first of all, the flame temperature is minim minimally affected by the for unity Lewis number. In general, it depends on the Lewis number of the deficient reactant in the mixture, fuel for lean, oxidizer for rich. And at stoichiometry, it depends on the Lewis number of the reactant, which is totally consumed in the, in the flame. Okay, this is what the theory have shown, and here is some uh, 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 results. Uh, I don't want to focus on this one so much, but on the next one. Uh, so experimentally, remember I have a few extra minutes for the batteries. So, And uh, so I uh, experimentally, uh, what uh, Ed Law did here, uh, there was a measurement of uh, uh, the 
temperature profile for different stretch rate. It was done in a counter flow. And then uh, it took all those profiles. So as you increase the stretch, of course, the flame would get closer and closer to the, uh, to the stagnation plane. Uh, and that's what you see here. This is a laboratory coordinate. And uh, he superimposed all those temperature uh, uh, on top of each other. And you see that the flame temperature is almost uh, undistinguishable. OK, so it, it's consistent with the first remark I made. Uh, but remember that this is also methane air. Uh, and uh, this is from DNS of propane air uh, in stoichiometric conditions. So this is just to show you that uh, even though it looks like the flame temperature or the burn temperature remain almost constant on, uh, you know, on this computational scale, if you are a little more careful uh, uh, and you focus on this region, you see that there is a slight uh, increase. It's not, it's not exactly constant. And um, here is a comparison with the theory. So uh, if uh, uh, the, the solid line are uh, the, 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 the theory and the dotted are, I think, the, the symbols are the numerically, uh, the numerical result. And it's done for propane air. So in a lean mixture, uh, we said it should depend on the Lewis number of the fuel. And so lean mixture is here. And so you get uh, uh, this uh, decrease, which is consistent. Well, I don't have the formula in front of me. But if you see the formula, you will see that it, it will provide this uh, trend. And uh, for a rich mixture, which let's take uh, this one, uh, 1.4, it should show a different trend, and indeed it shows a trend which is consistent with that form. Uh, what happens when you are close at stoichiometry or close to stoichiometry? Remember I told you that the uh, theory showed that it depends on the reactant which is totally consumed. Well, so we computed the reactant which is totally consumed. So you see uh, in, for phi equal to 1, in this case, the one that totally consumed was the fuel. And so the trend was consistent with that. And for this one, it was consistent. It was with, uh, for 1.05, it was the oxidizer. And the trend was consistent with that. So again, you show that there is a nice comparison between theory and experiment. Uh, there are some comments here about the Markstein lengths. I will run through this a bit quickly. Uh, if you are not careful where you evaluate your flame speed, whether on the unburned side or the burn side of the flame, because when you do it experimentally, you have to choose a certain location or a certain isotherm. Same thing if you do simulations. Uh, then you can actually get different trends. And that can be confusing. And that was seen in uh, spherically expanding flame calculation. Uh, both using a single step as well as using a detailed chemistry. Of course, when you use detailed chemistry, there is a spread in the data, which is not uh, as nice as when you use a single step. But anyway, so um, uh, you have to be careful uh, how to interpret this. It turned out that the correct, uh, for various reasons, that I don't have time to go through it, uh, the correct trend is uh, this one, which is the one closer to the burn side of the flame. And the reason for this is what you see in this graph. Uh, when you plot the Markstein number as a function, say, of temperature, meaning uh, as a function of the, what's going on in the flame thickness. In other words, if you choose different isotherm, you choose different uh, value of T. Then uh, the, near the uh, unburned gas, where T is close to 1, there is a very sharp change in the stretch rate, whereas if you, in the Monkstein number, sorry. And whereas when you compute it near the burn gas, the, it equilibrates somehow. So if you measure things on this end, if you measure at this point or this point, the difference is minor. And so you most likely will be consistent in your result. 
if you measure it here between one value and another, you can make big differences. And that's an important thing to remember. Uh, what did I want to say here? Okay. Um, I added those. It's not in your notes. There is sometimes some confusion about what is flame displacement and flame consumption, and uh, are they the same? The point here is that uh, in a planar flame, flame displacement means how this structure is displaced or moving to the left, the left in this condition. In other words, the time derivative of the flame position in time. Right? That's displacement. And uh, we have seen how we calculate it, and we have an expression for the laminar flame speed. Okay? Uh, but the same expression is obtained if you uh, define, uh, if you are interested in the, or if you refer to a consumption speed. In other words, you integrate uh, the time rate of change of the consumption of the fuel from uh, over the entire domain from negative infinity to infinity, and this is just to make it the proper units. And uh, that can be easily seen if you take your y equation and you integrate it from minus infinity to infinity. This, uh, uh, this one gives you the derivative, which have to go to zero, and this one gives you the difference uh, in, uh, the, gives you the essentially y f u minus zero, and so you get from here this relation from the integral, okay? So for a planar flame, whether displacement or consumption is the same. If you uh, want to define a consumption speed, well, we can go to the theory. In the theory, we have exact expression. We have solved the equation across the entire flame, including the reaction zone. So we can take this relation and integrate the reaction term. Now, since the reaction term in the theory is assumed to be zero on either side, it's only important in the reaction zone, that integration is easily done. If it is easily done, you get also a linear dependence. It's not very surprising that it would be also a linear dependence stretch. But the coefficient that you get here is not the Markstein length, not the unburn, not the burn. It's a different Markstein length. And if you try to confuse it with one or the other, you get contradictions. And so uh, this is the main point here. If you want more about it, I don't know if I made a reference to what to look at, but uh, I can tell you later. So this is the Markstein length uh, due to consumption. It's different than the L. It's different than LB. And uh, if we compare it with... Uh, uh, the numerical simulation of the spherical flame of uh, propane that I told you earlier, you get an exact similar correspondence, which is different than flame displacement. So you see the flame displacement uh, in this condition always has uh, a negative slope for all stretch. In this case, it has negative slope, but for, uh, what is the yellow? The yellow is for a rich, for phi equal to two, it has a different slope. So you have to also be careful about that. Uh, I don't have time to do the rest. I'll tell you roughly what it is. It's just some computation, numerical computation of um, the using the hydrodynamic theory to describe, say, Bunsen flame. You see that now uh, it, the flame is not just two straight line, but it properly describe the curved part uh, of the tip. And this is for uh, Poiset flow. And this is, th this I want to spend uh, two minutes on it. So uh, this is a, how do you obtain this? You will see on Friday. But this is a curved flame which propagates steadily into the unburned gas. And uh, this is based, a computation based on the hydrodynamic model. In other words, what we do, we solve the burn and unburn gas using uh, a constant density, and we uh, propagate the flame with a flame speed that depends on stretch. It's not an easy computation. I will make some comment about this in a different setting. Uh, but uh, the main point I want to say is this. This is done for propane, uh, 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 lean mixture, fee equal to 0.8. 
Now, in the theory, I, chose, I told you that the Markstein lengths uh, can be determined if you know sigma, if you know LF, if you know beta, if you know the laminar flame speed. So you take all these values, which were taken from, say, experiment. I don't remember exactly which one. And you evaluate an effective Lewis number and a Markstein length. OK? Now that you have those, those are the only two parameters, or actually the Markstein length is the only parameter that enter in this hydrodynamic model. And so you can compute the propagation of the flame. Note, by the way, that there are streamlines here that get emanated in the, in other words, there is an induced flow. It's not very clear, but there is an, in, actually it's in the front cover of your notes. So <laughs> you have a streamline that, uh, you have an induced flow in the unburned gas, and then the flow in the burned gas, those are velocities, axial velocities, so it's zero here, it's quite large here, and so on. Okay. So this is what you obtain, and this is the propagation speed, about 25, 20, 24% larger than the laminar flame speed. Now, if you do DNS of this one-step one chemistry model, here is the reference. This is the picture that you get. Nothing done to, to no adjustment, nothing. Just that's what you get. There is some, of course, deviation between the two, if you carefully look. But overall, it's a very good uh, representation of the actual flow with the propagation speed quite close to each other. I didn't expect more than this accuracy uh, for multiple reasons, but that's what you get. Uh, I think I will stop here, even though that's an interesting example, but uh, thank you.